So I first visited Ghana in 2015, right? Now, me having that idea that I can do something here, I said this the other day, I had to go to an internet cafe mm -hmm. to just communicate with my mom, mm -hmm. an internet cafe. We didn't have Ubers, we didn't have anything, but I still saw the potential in Ghana. I saw it as like, there's so much that can be done here, right? Because to me, in this state, it's saturated. A lot of people go broke because people come to Ghana and pay $3,000 a month in rent. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, in a year and a half, you can build something mad up Is anybody yourself. guilty here, please? Let's, let's yeah. you, you almost, almost there. Almost you can. There. Me being here by myself, I want to be comfortable. I'm not going to compromise my living space. I'm not going to come this far to be running from snakes in a bush. Like, I'm not doing that. You know what I mean? I see some people do it and it's just like, just go back home, take some more money and figure it out. The idea of us living big, we're just trying to maintain a lifestyle that we've already uh, accustomed to. Right. Moving to Africa automatically in people's world minds, like, oh, you want to live in a hut. Mm -hmm. I show people my house, they like, damn, that's nicer than the house you got. Yeah, so it's, it's available. You just have to be patient. Um, Ghana has everything that you need. Ghana has every luxury that you desire. It's just, can you afford it? And are you willing to adjust it? Right? Sometimes, not maybe just African Americans, but people that come in here, maybe they feel like they are better. And I've seen, I've seen that. And you, you're not gonna win if you think you're better because Ghanaians, even though they may have the poverty mentality, they are very smart. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot you can learn from Ghanaians. I feel like a lot of people feel that because we're from abroad, we open the doors, no. If a Ghanaian person likes you, they will open the doors for you. Mm -hmm. If they don't like you, no matter if you have the accent or the dollar, the door remains shut. So take your time when you're researching if you want to live in Ghana and come. I usually tell people, come and stay for at least one month. Yeah. Because one month gives you enough time to really... Get out of the tourism. Right. And I said, and, and, come, and come one month that is not a month of getting lit, yeah. a month of partying. Just come because you have a purpose to research and figure out what you want to do. I think different when I'm in Africa. Yeah. When I'm at home, it's such a hustle and bustle. Even now when I go back, like I, I can think clearly. You know, the song, I can think clearly now. That happened. I almost got shot twice by police in America. Mm. Twice. Mm. I grew up in an environment where people made fun of us for being African people, where people had the image of everywhere in Africa, everybody is starving, everybody is poor, everybody has disease, and there's war and conflict everywhere, is the image that everybody had. When, I, when my mom would go on vacation in Ghana, she would have her co-workers asking her to take pictures of lions, and she's like, lions in Ghana? Like, what, what, what? Hello guys and welcome back again to another amazing episode. This episode is quite different. It's a diaspora dialogue. And uh, we have all kinds of diasporas here. Diaspora is a very big umbrella. Usually when you say a diaspora, people think only African American qualify to be called a diaspora. But no, we have Ghanaians who relocated from Ghana to UK, US, built themselves there, you know, and came back here to Ghana. We have also people who went to Canada, UK. Today we do have all types of diaspora here. African American, one, a Ghanaian American, a UK American, a Canadian American, and they are all here. What we want to do is we will share our experiences to see if it's all the same. Um, and from my research, Ghanaian Americans located to the continent have high success rate uh, when they move back here compared to African Americans or people who have no root here. They might disagree with that, but we, this dialogue is going to help us understand if it's the same when you have a different experience. So without further ado, I do have here amazing people. They will introduce themselves to you. So without further ado, everybody, welcome on the show. Thank you for having um, us. Yeah, please do introduce yourself uh, to the people watching. We will start with you. I'm Deja, I'm from New York, and I've been living in Ghana for the past five years. I'm Rosh, I'm from New York as well, and I've been living in Ghana for three years and six months. Hi, I'm Lapel. And I'm from East London, and I've been in Ghana for just over a year. And we have the Ivy Prosper. <laughs> um, I'm Ivy Prosper, yeah. born in Ghana, <coughs> raised in Canada, so I became a Canadian citizen, and then moved back to Ghana. So in total, Ghana would be 10 years, because I did two years, I left briefly, and then came back. So total is 10 years. Now it's been eight years consistently, and the initial was two years. Interesting. Eight years. Now, what I want to ask is, how has it been so far for you uh, since you relocated? Five years now, how has it been? I've learned a lot. Um, 
I've had my fair share of ups and downs, but I'm super grateful that I've lasted this long, yeah. right? Because a lot of people don't. So, yeah, something is holding me here. Interesting. <laughs> Rush. Yeah, so I've been here for three years and six months. Uh, the first year and a half was brutal, but it's been great ever since. Yeah. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Well, I did do four years of secondary school in Ghana during my teenage years. So I already have a network of Ghanaian friends, some internationals, because I went to international school. So I already have like a network of people. So when I came back, I knew people that were already doing things in Ghana. So it was easier for me to come back. But yeah, after a few months of being in Ghana, recently i was looking for opportunities in europe <laughs> because i was like nah, i can't do this anymore yeah. what happened? i just got meters. a bit demotivated because mm -hmm. sometimes you can get angry with people's mindsets yeah and sometimes like i don't need this yeah. i can i can i don't i can just live with my life i can have 24 7 electricity mm -hmm. good transportation systems i can, I can let me just <laughs> Let me just live my youth in a place which is more stable, you know what I mean? And I'll come back when I'm older. But I'm like, no. Like, there's a reason why I came here. And there's people that wished they would have come here earlier. So why am I now going to go back yeah, on myself? Let me just get through the hard times now. Yeah. I like that. I actually Quite interesting. was doing that too. During yeah. COVID time, I was looking for a job mm -hmm. because I'm like, my business wasn't running and I'm like, I'm not making any money. I'm broke here in Ghana and that's not fun, right? Especially coming from a certain lifestyle. And I was, I applied for so many jobs. I even hired someone to help me look for jobs. Interesting. Remote jobs, anything, and nothing was coming. Mm -hmm. And I was saying to my, first of all, my mom was like, absolutely not. Like, you're the one here. You are the reason why we all come to Ghana. So you have to stay and figure it out. But I'm like, mom, I'm broke. Like, what do you want me to do? I can't even pay my rent, right? So. The fact that I wasn't getting a job, I was, I was not being honest on certain resumes. And the fact that I made it so pretty and they were still denying me, I was like, is a reason why I have to stay here. Like, I have to just figure it out. So yeah. I'm glad it didn't work out. I like, I like the candidness. <laughs> yeah. I also thought of going back when, when I bought, you know, my mm -hmm. commercial property and somebody took me to court. I mean, I won after two years, but... Congratulations. In, yeah. In the, while, while, like... That's what I came to Ghana to do. And now there is nothing I can do. I wake up and there is nothing to do. Mm -hmm. um, but luckily, you know, I set up some residual income, so feeding myself and stuff is not, a, it wasn't a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but waking up every day and not knowing what to do, it sucks. So I'm like, should I just go back and try to be productive and let the case run on? And then when it's over, I come back. But I'm glad I didn't because I stayed back and I have a YouTube channel. I run like five companies now, doing really well. So, yeah, during the hard times, I was able to figure it out. So I'm happy I stayed, but I definitely thought of going back. Same. Yeah, I had like six months of really like mental agony of like, wow, did I really make the yeah. right choice? It's almost like everybody goes through this. Yeah. yeah. Ivy. Yes. Did you have any similar experiences in the early stages when you relocated to Ghana? Or yours is quite different? I, um, I had had my breakdown when I felt like, what am I doing here? Um, the, the first two, the two years that I came, 2011 to 2013, at that time, in the beginning stages, um, I had not actually planned to stay. My plan when I came was actually, it was supposed to just be a getaway. Like, I wasn't coming to stay. And within the first couple of weeks, I was blessed and got offered a job. It was a part-time job working with SOS College, mm -hmm. the school in Tema, where I was running a creative writing club, which was an after-school club. So that was like three times a week that I was doing that. I would go and, and conduct these workshops for the young people. But there was a period of time when I did have like a breakdown because of the frustrations mm. um, in Ghana that you face when you're not used to the way the system is here. Um, I'll never forget the day that I was with my aunt and we were, um, going on spin text, we were going to buy furniture that she needed for her business, and and I just broke down. I was like, "What am I doing here?" I was, and I, I broke down crying oh, that day. It's not a, share, a story that I've shared really until until now, um, but that day was just like, "What am I? What am I doing?" Like, mm -hmm. yes, I enjoyed with the, working with the students, everything, but there were a lot of other things that I found extremely frustrating being here at the time. 
And uh, I mean, she just encouraged me because, you know, she also had lived in the UK and moved back to Ghana. So she talked about, you know, you have these kinds of experiences when you become accustomed to a certain system and then you move somewhere else. One of the ways that I have been able to get through sometimes when I go through things is I remind myself, mm -hmm. this must be what my parents felt like mm -hmm. when they left Ghana mm -hmm. to move to Canada. Interesting. To go through a lot of these um, challenges because you're not used to the way a system is. Right. Different challenges, of course, but also equally things that can frustrate you when you're living somewhere else. So I have that, and then fortunately I got another job hosting a TV show. Um, so I ended up getting this amazing job um, traveling across the country. I was hosting a show called the Maternal Health Channel TV series. So it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. It ended up being a great experience. So. Um, when I left Ghana in 2013, after we finished production on that, and then when I was in Canada, I kept thinking, I want to come back to Ghana. And then when I came back mm -hmm. in 2016, it was completely different because the economy had completely changed from what it was before. Things weren't as simple as it was before. And it was a real tough time for me for about five months mm -hmm. trying to find work. And because of that, I always advise people, if you are moving from the diaspora to Ghana, don't come to look for a job, mm -hmm. come to create something. Um, or if you are looking for a job, look for the job before you leave your country. Mm -hmm. Because when you look for the job before you leave, the companies here are more likely to pay you in your foreign currency mm -hmm. and at a better rate than when you come here and you're already here. Because then it becomes they're recruiting you to come. Mm. And it's best to do that with international companies. So, and in certain industries as well, like if you work in like oil and gas or something, those kinds of industries and tech, mm -hmm. and they have an international office mm -hmm. in Ghana, then they're more likely to be the type that would, you know, court you with mm -hmm. better salaries and better incentives. Because I know mm -hmm. people who have moved and got, yeah. got rent paid, got cars paid, mm -hmm. because they were working for an international company. So mm -hmm. that's the advice that I give to people now. Mm -hmm. I like that, but I don't think that's easy to find anyways. No, it's not easy, but it's a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. I want us to address the, what makes it so hard. You, you made an example that our family goes to the UK, US, and they have a, a tough time yeah. as much as we go to. I want us to talk about what makes us go through that kind of changes and wanting to go back, right? Just deep dive with that, mm -hmm. but there's a new uh, guest here, uh, she came in a little bit late, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, so we will introduce her briefly and then we continue the conversation. Welcome on the show. Thank you. Um, please briefly introduce yourself sure. uh, to the people watching. Hi everybody, my name is Adrienne Quarter. Um, I'm originally from Washington DC in the metro area. I've been living in Ghana for five years now, but been coming back and forth to Ghana since 2005 when I genetically found out that my ancestors were Ashanti. Mm -hmm. So that's what brought me here, um, just to explore and to really see if it was really true. <laughs> and when I came here, I saw people that looked like everybody in my family. So I sent the word back, we're from Ashanti tribe. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was here. Awesome, so how long have you been here so far? I've been living here consistently for five years. Five years, how, yeah. how has it been living, I mean, look, even though your heritage was from here, did you have family members Absolutely here? Absolutely not. No okay. aunties, no grandma, not even godmother. Like nobody, <laughs> nobody in Shanti that I knew on, on ground. Um, so when we came, you know, you just kind of feel your way out. You find your family, mm -hmm. your family finds you. Mm -hmm. You you a lot. Your Ghana family. Yeah. So that happens over the years, the last twenty five years. Um, but since I've been living here, um, I've, I've leaned on that family that I've made since 2005. I had a godfather that was half Ghanaian and that brought me here in 2005. So his family immediately just turned into my family. Um, he died in a plane crash in 2008, which like severed my connection here because mm. that was my connection. So I came back blindly um, a couple years after he died just looking for his family with no address, no number, just a name. And I found them. So we were, we were able to reconnect, and that's my Ghana family. But. I like that. Um, most of them here said in the early stages when they relocated, <laughs> went through tough times almost. They were like, you know, can I just go back? I don't know if my stages ended, but. <laughs> <laughs> Five years in, we have, you have to be strong. You know, anything's possible in Ghana. Uh, one of my, my right hand men told me that all the time here, so I stand on that. Mm -hmm. I said, although you have tough times, you know, anything's possible. And that's not necessarily true 
in other places that we come from. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we're hardworking people. We make it happen. We invent it. It's not created. All the things, but like when you get to Ghana, the hard time is just different. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, of course, you have your hard time in talking to your community and being tapped in. They encourage you. Everyone says, oh, we've been through all that. Oh, that's nothing. Oh, your generator was stolen. Yeah, that's normal. <laughs> like, you know, mm -hmm. um, when, when you hire people and you train them and you help and they still rob you blind, blindly, like, it's, a, it's an adjustment. Um, mm -hmm. You have to realize that the culture is a little different um, and the exposure level is a little different. So when you expose people to a lot of things, a lot of times they're not able to really manage that well to say it in a nice way <laughs> uh, so yeah hard times are for everybody <laughs> i like that can we address what what do you guys think is the most common challenge diasporans all go through after relocating to that for me as a business woman staff for me as a business woman staff uh, I, 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 I think, think it's a uh, land and building mm -hmm. for most people mm -hmm. that try to dive into it for the most part mm -hmm. i yeah. think it's security Security. Yes. Security. I think it's security. Elaborate on that. The roads, number one. The roads are not great. And also, just not feeling as if you have things at the tip of the fingers. I can't call an ambulance that can get here in the next 15. Convenience or security. Like, if you come with children, if anything happens to them, what is your point of call? You have to create your own world. Make sure you get health insurance. These things, you have to intentionally create your own plan. Whereas back home, we know the numbers, we can just call them, and we have that sense of security in that way. But here, it's like you're left to your own devices, so you have to create your own security. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I mean, some of what you're saying is, is a little bit true with um, having access, because I think of it as having, having access to some things that we found to be simple and easily, as she said, you can just dial a number and then you get the ambulance to come. And so I also, would say that some of the challenges that the diaspora face are infrastructure in general and um, understanding of poverty mindset because people do some of the things that they do. Mm. So in Canada, I'll speak from the Canadian experience, somebody who's poor in Canada will go to the system and get welfare or social assistance as they now have called it to support them in what they need help in doing. Um, find, try to find low income housing to help them to live somewhere that's not going to be as expensive based on what their income is, or if they're homeless, they have the option of looking for homeless shelters to stay in. Um, I'm not saying it's perfect there, but those are some of the resources that people may have access to. Whereas here, if you're poor and you're struggling, you're suffering, you are left to your own devices to figure out how you're going to survive. So I, with my YouTube channel, um, I used to have, when I was posting more often, I used to get a lot of comments, a lot of people sending me messages. And I remember one message, one message from a woman who said she had $3,000, she has two kids, she wants to move to Ghana, and she wanted to know if there's any um, food stamps, social assistance to help her to survive when she comes to Ghana. I was like, no, <laughs> you cannot come to this country with only $3,000 and two children and think you're going to survive. You will struggle and you'll get depressed and then you'll complain about Ghana and then you'll, you'll need to go back and then you won't even have money to get a flight to go back. So, um, so yeah, so the infrastructure, conveniences of things are the things that people find difficult. And then land and rent issues because you're used to coming from a system where when you're renting, you, at least in Canada and the US, you pay what they call first and last month's rent, which is basically two months. Then you live, then you just pay month on. Whereas here in Ghana, they're like, oh, I need a year up front, I need two years up front. Even some people ask me for three, four, and five years up front. How are people coming up with this kind of money all in one chunk? So people who live here who know that that's how it's always been, well not always been, but that's how it's been for a long time, they will come up with the money, pay it, and then they're struggling because they've used their entire savings to pay for their rent. Mm. And then they're struggling from month to month because now they have the savings and now they're saving to pay for the rent when it comes up mm. to you again. With that, I think we should have a different story in regards to that. You relocated with already built house that yes, you moved into. Yes, yes. How did that help your process? I, I say that, that I think that's the best way to move to yeah. Ghana. Um, unless maybe you have some residual income that will come in no matter what, so that that will, that will take care of the rent aspect because rent is 
Basically, basically your biggest headache, and I built a house before I came, and I knew that. So, you know, even if you have like a thousand dollars saved up somewhere, that would bring, I mean, I mean, if you set up a residual income, that you get like even a thousand dollars every month, if you own your house, then you're okay in Ghana. But if you don't, that's nothing, right? So, um, I think if you want to move to Ghana and you can own your house, is the best because that's like your biggest expense, your biggest headache in Ghana and the rest food is cheap if you don't have it survival is really cheap like you can squeeze three hundred dollars a month and live on it if you don't have it you'll be just fine but I think so. that's the constant <coughs> African way in the West we always see Africans come educate save up money send money back eventually go back so this is new to us we don't have the land that was inherited we don't have the ideas the wherewithal to know that you need to start building 10 years before you start to come. You need to start visiting. We just don't know. We just know we needed a new place. We needed a greener grass and we needed more blackness. So we came here on that. And then when we get here, we realize, oh, now we get it why all the people working hard in America keep sending money back and they actually have a place to come. Right. So this is us developing a new um, awareness of this African lifestyle. So it's going to take a while, but um, it's, it's easier for continental Africans to come back and to set that up. A little more difficult for diaspora because we just don't have it. But it you can do it. You can plan it. I tell people all the time, do not come on your first visit to move. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do that. A lot of people. That's why I say it. Yeah. Come on one trip and then they're like, I'm moving. And I understand America gets unless, stressful. Okay, okay. Yeah, unless they have a family property. Like, for example, my mom built her house as years. Yeah, that's what I'm right. saying. Yeah, you're not so Yeah. You and myself. Do you think? Do you think? But the okay. thing right now is that you, there's no excuse anymore due to the internet. Mm. Like, like, there's people that are helping, educating non-continental African Americans mm -hmm. on how to move back in right. an appropriate right. way. Right. And even there's schemes that the government is doing and giving no. land. That's, that's not true. Yes, <laughs> but let's go into it. Let's go into it. I hear that a lot. Let me finish my point then okay. after you can finish your point. Because, okay, so what, what I'm saying, what, what I'm saying is that I've heard and I've seen online this, this is what I've seen. seen. Whether like it's true or not, this is what I've seen. Like, because at the end of the day, YouTube is not real. But there are people that are educating people on how to move back and how to buy land before they do come. People so like non continent Rush. Yeah, like Rush. <laughs> so there are non-continental people that are having access, but you have to be careful. Not everybody who goes on YouTube is the real deal. Mm. So you do have to come and link up with people face to face and meet people, go and come and liaise with people. But what, I'm, what I've seen is people have bought land for cheap and they have been schemes. Whether it's real or not, that's, that's what I've seen. But please, Ivy, educate okay, us, because yes. now it's not real. <laughs> so, um, so I worked with the government for five and a half years, um, under the year of return and then beyond the return. And so one of the misconceptions people have is that the government is giving away land <coughs> to the diaspora, but that is not true. So it is chiefs who have made a decision and they want to allocate land to people from the diaspora. The chief is not the government. But mm. like you'll have YouTube creators who come online and say, the government is giving free land to Ghana, I mean, to the diaspora. The government is doing this, the government is doing that. But it's not the government who allocated those lands for the diaspora. I mm. just want to repeat it again. Mm. It's specific chiefs in specific communities who made a decision they want to allocate land for the diaspora. And the reasons why chiefs would make these types of decisions is because they may have a lot of land that is undeveloped, and they see the opportunity of the diaspora who want to find a place to call home and see them as people who have the potential to help them develop the land into something that can be a community for the future. Because we know things start from grassroots level. East Lagon wasn't East Lagon that it is today 30 years ago. You know, 40 years ago, it was Bush. There was like five homes in the area, a half family who bought property here when it was just a few homes. And people were like, why are you buying land, uh, land in the bush? Who lives in the bush? It should be a little zoo or be here. But now look at us now, where this Lagana is from then. So these chiefs recognize the potential. So if you have lots of people coming from the asphalt looking for places where they can develop, they may not have access to huge funds to, to buy land in, in East Lagon or Kasako or airport. 
but somewhere that's outside of Accra is more lucrative because it's, it's more affordable. So the government was who decided to, to allocate these, these lands to... But what, whichever it is, do you think they deserve, diaspora deserve free land? Uh, well, was it really free? Was, no, it was really free. free. It was really, it was really fully free. There's an administrative fee that they're being charged that's um, <laughs> it's, it's set to be for um, the surveyor of the land and, and different and documentation, that kind of thing. So, um, but the land itself is what they said is deemed as free and you're paying an administrative fee. That's what they, what mm -hmm. they said. Um, I do think that it helps with having a softer landing for people who don't have any connection to the country. The people who have a connection have an easier time adjusting to Ghana and an easier time um, not abandoning the Ghanaian dream mm -hmm. because we have ties, family ties. And I say that very strongly Something because, to fall back because on. of my work, I have been around Ghanaian diaspora, I've been around um, diaspora who were displaced because of the transatlantic slave trade, which was really actually the human trafficking of Africans, and then also people who are continental Africans coming from countries like Nigeria and decide they want to come to Ghana. So I've been around these people so much that that's where my, my thoughts on this issue come. Um, of who is easier, who is easier to yeah. mm -hmm. to stay, to mm -hmm. stick out. Because for me, for example, when I was you know going through my challenges of should I stay, and sometimes I still have that. You know, my uncle would be like, oh, don't stay, don't leave, don't leave. You know, there's still stuff you can do. You have the encouragement of family, even though some family may look at you as, hey, you came from abroad, you have money. But uh, at the end of the day, there's still your family. You still have some kind of connection. Where somebody who doesn't can just be like, I'm done with this place. Why am I going to stick it out? Mm. For what? Mm. Right? Mm. Yeah. No, I said me. It's, it's, no. it's, 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 I was agreeing to it. It's, 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 it's funny fun because um, well, well, I didn't tell any of my family members that I'm thinking about going because they would say, Yes! Go back! <laughs> so uh, it was That's actually a white friend of mine who said, No, 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 you gotta make it. Like, mm -hmm. I know who you are. I love that. So, yeah, I know people still look at me now, like, I work with the chiefs and all that, selling land, and people look at me. They look at me, they see the money I'm making and everything, but they still look at me like, What the hell are you doing here? Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's ingrained in our minds that you cannot. Why, why would you give up America to come here? Mm -hmm. So, for my family, it's like nobody would encourage you to stay here. Mm -hmm. Now I think my own parents will because they've seen what I'm doing and all that. But in the beginning, it's like, even coming here was a challenge. Like, what, why are you coming to Ghana? Like, are you crazy? So, yeah, that's, that's great. I think my mom was praying for me. Maybe whoever is bewitching me to come yeah, back yeah, yeah. to Ghana. You know, I mean, for the Ghanaian story, we have a lot of stories like, oh, don't go back into Ghana because there's witches there, they will destroy you. <laughs> Am I lying? Yeah, that's good. So, but so, anyways. Me, no, no, no family member was encouraging me to come okay, down here. Okay. But then after the fact, after the fact, mm -hmm. with the impact I'm making and all that, now I think if I'm to say I want to leave, they will say no. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Deja, who encouraged you when you, you feel like giving up and, and going back? My mom. Mm -hmm. My mom puts it in me that basically, like, I don't have a choice. Yeah. Because it's not, it's not about me anymore right it will be my own selfish reason to go back to the states but when i first started out i don't think anyone believed me that i was going to make such a move right because everything that i'm doing is completely new and out of the norm for me so it was like oh okay she likes to travel that sounds good let's let's just see where it goes for her mm -hmm. but when i came this was so i first visited ghana in 2015 right now me having that idea that i can do something here then where I said this the other day, I had to go to an internet cafe mm -hmm. to just communicate with my mom. Mm -hmm. An internet cafe. Mm -hmm. We didn't have Ubers, we didn't have anything, but I still saw the potential in Ghana. I saw it as like, there's so much that can be done here, right? Because to me in the States, it was saturated. And when I went back home, I'm telling my mom, I'm like, I think I'm gonna start a business in Ghana. She's like, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Then I wrote down an entire plan for like a whole year. And my grandparents came and we stayed in East Legon at a friend's house. And when they stayed there, and they saw the cars and the houses, and they saw the beauty of it, right? Completely different from what we know back in the States of what Africa is to be. 
So they was like, okay, I get it. Like, I understand now. But how are you going to make it happen? So for me, I have the, luckily I'm blessed with a, a great support system of my family. Um, they call me the pioneer of the family. So again, it's on me to get us out of our normal life back home. So yeah. And then also you have to be mentally strong because I'm here by myself. Everybody, nobody's going through this journey with me, right? I'm going through this path by myself. So yes, my mother encourages me. Yes, my family encourages me, but they are not here with me. Mm -hmm. Like they're not going through the struggles and the, the heartache and the light out and the no, the no, <laughs> the no water running. I couldn't even iron my clothes today because it was a light out. <laughs> But, you know, these are the things that it doesn't matter what anyone else is, but what anyone else say, you have to have that um, determination within yourself. Mm -hmm. I just recently saw that you had a, a move in, you were trying to move or you got kicked out of your house or renting or something like that. Kicked out? Mm -hmm. Jesus. <laughs> Maybe you could have made it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think I put that out, but technically I still, you th yeah. You think if you had a house here before moving, would would it have helped you? Definitely. What do you want to say? About because it? again, when I first moved, I there was there wasn't the YouTube community that we have now, right? So I was trying to figure out on the internet where to move, how does the rent work, all of these things, and the information wasn't there online. And so I didn't even know that I needed a full year up front. So that like Ivy said, that took a majority of my savings. Absolutely. And so now you're left with a chunk of money gone. And I was like, okay, it's time to work. It's time to figure things out. And that's when I immediately realized that things don't work on New York time here, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So that was a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. You you uh, sign a contract, you give your money, and you expect it to be done at a specific time and date, and it's not. So you, I I, I definitely think because mm -hmm. even now I'm being charged in dollars for my place mm -hmm. that I'm going into, and. Um, it is not cheap. Yeah, it's like the, the, the challenge of um, the ranks that you're mentioning is definitely a big, big issue and being charged in dollars. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize things are charged in dollars mm -hmm. when it comes to rent and buying property, which makes it difficult. Because you come in here thinking, oh, it's going to be a different currency, it's going to be more affordable, and then it ends up being, you know, for Almost me, the same amount. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For me, I always tell them, I said, uh, in, in America, we don't talk CDs. <laughs> exactly. So why are we talking dollars? Yeah, and, and for me, my landlord never been to America. Why are you charging me a dollar? <laughs> that pisses me off. There's the economic thing. reasons for that, right? Because the dollar is more stable than the city. was important in dollars to build a house. Yeah. I mean, he knows better. Why do you think Ghanaian businesses always try to say? Well, they say dollar or city is equivalent. So the reason behind that is we sell land in cities. The price is always in cities because the land is in Ghana. But if you are building, most of the stuff is important. Mm -hmm. So if, let's say, I'm building a house, a two-bedroom, I'm selling for $80,000. There is a reason behind that. It's the $80,000 for cities equivalent. So at the date of, you can give me cities, but it's going to be the exchange rate. Right. The reason behind that is if I charge you cities, three months later, I'm losing money. So that, oh, I'm going to keep increasing it from. 1 million cities to 1.2 million cities when you hear me up, 1.4 million cities, and you're going to say, oh, why do you keep changing the price? So we just put the dollar down and it pegs it. They, they say dollar or cities are equivalent. That's been the case for a long time. Because yeah. I remember, and I'm going to go way back. I remember in the 90s, 1998, I tried to start handbags in Ghana because I actually came after I graduated university and I was doing handbags that were woven. And then I had gone back to Canada, and then the guy was like, sends me um, an email from this Yahoo, because people did Yahoo back then. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, his machine is broken, and so now he's charging me, it was like double the price of what we had agreed. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, oh, the city's going up and down, so the price is different. Anyway, it can be quite frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So okay. that's, the dollar just keeps it stable. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that, so let's say, um, Two months ago, as a matter of fact, I built houses. So when you buy land for me, it's always in cities. When we are designing for you, it's always in cities. But the moment we price you for the house, you, everything is in cities. But then we divide it, it's 14 at the time. We have people are building for right now, a year ago, and we pegged it to 14, right? Mm -hmm. And now, so when, to 14, like we divided, so let's say, just to make the number simple for myself, let's say it was 1.4 million Ghana cities divided by 14, it's $100,000 house. And that's just 14. 
Ada ada data. Oh, to make the number simple. Exchange rate. Yes. Okay. One dollar. So one dollar equals fourteen Ghana cities. That the exchange rate at the time. So we know it's a hundred dollars. So right now, uh, is if I change, I mean hundred thousand dollars. If I change the hundred thousand dollars right now, I will probably get one point six. Nine. Yeah. 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 Millions of Ghana cities like, or whatever. Yeah. So there has been increasing uh, in cement prices, iron rods, and all that. So I end up now losing. And I can't, when once we're in a contract, I can't come to the client and tell you, oh, Iron Ross went up, Taz went up, because that's the case. It's just unprofessional. Mm. So, whatever it is, that's what it is. That's oh, the dynamics that. behind it. Mm. Interesting. <clears throat> also, but when you're planning to come again, no, diaspora is not getting paid to come here. No, there are no programs from the government. No, there's no free land. Even the land that's, that's gifted that we're paying an administrative fee, there's nothing on that land. It's bare bones. So, it's not free because to do anything you have to put everything into it mm -hmm. so it's actually more expensive than when you think about it because of infrastructure so it may be cheaper for me to buy a plot oh, piece my own because it's already developed it's the context anywhere in the plot right you can, you can go out a bit uh where you don't have to for what What's i understand the, the chiefs for the chiefs uh were still charging like thousand five hundred dollars for administration that's like the price of land in that area, like all the way out, maybe a thousand dollars discount or something. Mm -hmm. Because the plot of land for somewhere like a Dodua, four thousand nine hundred, four thousand five hundred dollars, and that's like on only an hour away from Accra, yeah. where this land is like way out there. Um, so you just have to do your research and and, and all but that. But there's so many yeah. misconceptions. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, there is a a a recruitment process for us to come here and also we are wanting to come so that meeting each other creates this influx of diaspora in Ghana the doors were open we're willing to come but when we get here it's not pretty right okay. and my advice my advice if you're watching this is try not to get a cheap deal in Ghana like pay the five thousand if you're going to build yeah. a house that's going to cost you a hundred thousand dollars pay that five thousand dollars to find land yeah. and pay for it but well, there is a lot of wahala. Mm -hmm. Wahala in Ghana means a lot Sad. of back and forth. So that so comes to this free stuff. Yeah. Me personally, you are better off spending that five. If you, you can build a house for ninety thousand, eighty thousand dollars, why do you want free land so bad? Yeah. That's just me. I think it all depends on what you want as well because every person is different. Not everybody wants to be in a crowd. Some people want to be out. And what I've noticed is there is a large diaspora community that is that, that gravitates towards the central region for a reason. So there is a community of African Americans in the central region. Some people want to be there. So it all depends on what the person wants yeah. as far as where they choose to, to live. And I, I want to just make one quick statement before you speak about land. I want the diaspora especially African Americans, because they're the ones who are the most vocal, is to know that land scams, land issues in Ghana, they are not intentionally targeting so you as, as an African American. American. Because a lot of African Americans will come on online and be like, they don't want us here, they scammed us, they did this, they did that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying everybody says that, but I'm seeing, but I've noticed a trend. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I want to understand it's not targeted. Poverty it's not mentality makes people make these decisions and they don't do it only to African Americans, they do it to Ghanaians. Yes. And they do it to everyone. You are land right. disputes are the number one thing in the court system in Period. Ghana. Eighty percent of court disputes in Ghana are land. So to avoid all this yeah. to avoid all this, we had a plan. We had a, a phased out plan. I was familiar to Ghana. I knew I couldn't jump, do not move here on your first visit. You have to see so much and do. So we had a, a three-phase plan. Our first phase was stay in a hotel for one month. Um, so we ended up picking a really nice hotel that gave us a discount rate because it was a one-month thing. Within that one month, we took our time working with an agent to find a temporary home, not a permanent place because it takes time. And the more time you have, the, the more likely you are to find what you want. And not that we all want free land, but it's like something that's one of the benefits that are afforded to us mm -hmm. and it comes with a lot of mahalo too but mm -hmm. like i have a plot in, in in one of the one of the villages now i'm not necessarily wanting to go there now but it's something that like oh, okay that's nice great i'll take a couple right but i'm still so living like that then Say it again. You live in the London. Like yeah, and that's not really what they want. They want you to be, <laughs> buy and build. Yeah. Yeah. At least put a room yes. like, or wall in it. Right. Let, let me come, let me come in there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, buy a land. From my experience, having been in more than 100 land transactions in Ghana, including 
owning a lot of land and selling land to a lot of people. You can have all the documentation you want, mm -hmm. but until you've warded or done something, Doesn't your land is at risk. Okay. Yeah. Somebody so, else. yeah, so that means you do something small. Yeah. They, they, you have to take possession of the land. The person who's in possession of the land, whether they have documents or not, you're actually going to have a very hard time kicking them out. Just well, so it is, yes. in, in these villages, they, they protect them. How many years? 12 years. It's for adverse possession. It, it, in, a lot, in a lot of the Pan African villages, you don't have the local issue as much because they actually have walled that off. So I've had this spot for like two years. It's still, I was there yesterday. So you don't have it, the encroaching issues that you normally would have in a random plot in Ghana. Right. So this is a Pan African <laughs> village where everybody around you is Pan African. So you don't have okay. Any, okay. The, the normal piece. So mm. although they don't want you just to buy and go, mm. if you buy and go, you're okay. You don't mm. have a squatter on your land just because it's been vacant and you've been away. Right. So that's the protection of working within these villages because you don't have all of the wahala that comes with just a random plot. Right. right. And, and plus, okay, being, a bit out, it's less, <laughs> being a bit out there is a bit less stressful. Yeah. Than yeah, same yeah, yeah. place in Accra, mm -hmm. in Pence, like Kumasi and all these places. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you need a plan. You need a plan. You need a you need a phased out plan so that you're not rushed to do anything. Because that's right. when you go broke. Because you got to get something now and all the money. Figure it out. Like, so just plan you, it out. When you go broke, you, you have to go back. <laughs> so you don't want to go back. Some people go so broke they can't. They can't even pay <laughs> back. <laughs> you go broke and get stuck. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not gonna name people like that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people that leave. And then the other thing, when you when you come here, we give it all. Yeah, that's what Africans don't understand. Like you, a lot of times, a lot of times, we sell everything. We do so much. We drop. When you leave work at home, you can't just be like, "Hey, I'm back." Like you really give it up to come here. So you don't really have the the the, the flexibility of always necessarily just going back. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm gonna say something on that. I feel like us coming in right we we get so excited because and then i wonder some people's intention too like are you coming here to actually work and build or are you coming here to say oh look what i have i have land in ghana and i have land in africa look what i built right so i see a lot of people come here and spend so much money to go big mm. and in ghana Ghana will humble you so fast. You Bring have to start off small. And I think, again, us coming from the West, we, don't we have do a small things mentality. big, right? <laughs> we do things big. We want the biggest house. We want the biggest restaurants. And I had to learn that. And that's why I started off with a food that's truck. I, yeah. And so you, you go to a lot of places and it's empty. And, and then you spend so much money on the rent and your staff and all of these things. And us as diasporans, we think, oh, but... Why is this happening to me? This is just the culture. You have to learn the culture of Ghana before you invest so much money. And it's not to say don't do it, but it's like take your time and be patient with Ghana because we're coming from a place that's already developed and, and old, right? Ghana is what, 60 yes. to four? Five? Don't ask me. 65 years, 67? Oh, getting old, man. I know. Old man now. Ghana is only 67 years old, right? So we have to understand that it's still developing. All these things that we're expecting of Ghana is of the Western world. Right. So it looks pretty and it's nice and it's enjoyment and you can have a great time, but you have to learn patience. That's so true. We, yeah. What do you think we can do to, um, on the continent to facilitate the process of transition to the continent? A proper system. Like a, something, a pro something a structure to show us are you are you asking as far as like us coming to move here or i mean the system here government it could be government i think well, accountability think? like we need something like a step by step of what is the way it's supposed to be mm -hmm. right because here it's just like anything goes if you have money you can pay somebody off right, right. and no one is held accountable so what is really the way but the thing is, mm. even for the Ghanaians themselves, there's not a step by step. I had to go and collect a land certificate to my mom. She has a land in um, Ogojo, near East Legon. She bought the land a long time ago. I had to go and collect a certificate. I, when I went there, I had to go back and forth. There was not even anything written how to do this. That's why so I even for the simple thing for Ghanaians, it's not so. Okay, so they're going to think, why are you so special? 
Like the government hasn't even done simple things step by step for the common Ghanaian in a country. Now you want to move it into the country. Why should we now set up a whole system for you? But yeah, now this is just so No, yes, yeah, we because we're talking, system. we're talking mainly about transitioning, a system for transitioning. I think we have to go back to the drawing board and say Ghana needs to start from the ground up. It's not just about we have to make it comfortable for the diasporans. We have to make it comfortable for all. So mm. let us diasporans get involved in policy. If you really see us on yeah. A long term, let us get involved in making this place a better place for everyone because we don't want it to be the Africans against the Africans. Mm. Like, we are not Im more important than them. No, no. absolutely not. But I think the, the misconception right. is Ghana has invited the Western community to come here. Mm -hmm. So, when you invite it, you do an all call out for the diaspora to come back to Ghana. What we are used to in our world that you're bringing us to, right, mm -hmm. um, is different. And in America, or a Western country, they have systems set up for when they do things like that. Mm -hmm. When America calls out for a particular type of uh, culture to come, they give them free rent, they give them tax breaks, they give them like their system set up. Mm -hmm. So although we don't know what to expect when we get here, we heard the call. But those systems are developed nations. I, we don't have their budget. I, I, think, I think the task has and stuff, they, that, the they can implement that. that. Mm -hmm. The other, the other is that really more complicated where like, you know, uh, point systems in place mm -hmm. is, you know, there are, work, there are people who are working there and I say Ghana is not art more than it is science. Mm -hmm. So since it's an art, there are people eating mm -hmm. from this, going here, yes. going here. So then are, they're not, it's not so easy to do, you know, but things like, you know, tax breaks, that, that one the government has full control over, mm -hmm. um, you know, helping, you know, important stuff, they do this is crazy. If somebody is trying to set up something nice, it can be reviewed. And maybe they get a cut here and that. Uh, Raj, why do you think other people are still succeeding, even locals who have never traveled, still succeeding, making millions with this system? system that it's, a, it's an broken. art. You can you can make it work, right? Mm -hmm. It's an art that you can you can really make it work. You just have to understand. I think that's the problem that most of the diaspora <clears> we have is we think we know it all, mm. and things should be our way. Mm -hmm. We think we think we can change the system, and the thing is, you cannot change the system. So you have to understand the system as it is, uh, chipping, like what she's saying, what you think it should be, but also respect what's on the ground. And I will also uh, mention that local Ghanaians get scared. My neighbor, where I live, I have a neighbor to my left, a neighbor to my right, both of them. This is their third land before they were able to build. So it's, it, it is what it is on the ground. You, you get it, whether you're a diaspora, or whether you're a Ghanaian, you're a Nigerian, they don't care. Mm. It's about getting the money in their pocket, and they don't care whether it's coming from UK, US, Ghana. They will take it. <laughs> So you have to educate yourself, understand the system that you are in, and if you want to be here, work within it. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's so do you that's think it. it's okay for it to just stay the same as I'm it saying is? while also contributing to how we can make it better. Mm -hmm. So if you are impatient, then you should probably go back and wait for it to get better, which can take 50 years for that yeah. to happen. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. But just about you saying the ordinary Ghanaian, sorry, Envy, because um, I might lose track of this. The ordinary Ghanaian um, making money. There's money in the city. You think there's not, it's always money in the dollar. The watcher said that every morning. That's so the watcher and the fish and the egg. You know how much money they make. So don't come here trying to do things big. See, look, the people need water. People need bread. People need, what are the common things Eggs. that people need every day you eat? That's yeah. the biggest thing, finding, yeah, the gu finding the African business, not yes. necessarily yes. always bringing the American exactly. business. Exactly. Great. Great. We, did, yeah. we, we did a whole wellness center, a huge two-story, big old place, huge rent, and we were making CDs. <laughs> yeah. The dollars where we were charged rent in dollars, we made all this money, we spent all this money, rebuilt this, I mean, just made it what we wanted it to be. And we close that shop up every year. I have a car wash. That's everyday business. And there's money in there, you know. And I see all the car washes. These guys are making 2,000, 5,000 cities a day mm -hmm. in car wash. Yeah. And you will respect it. Small. You want to be fancy. Yeah. Small. 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 Start small. Yeah. Yeah. Small. And find out what they need. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to what she was saying with the washing sellers, the simplest businesses can be the most successful. I was actually, I was at a, a diaspora event that um, the group Ahaskora had, I think it was about two years ago, and there was a woman who spoke about how we miss the mark on simple things, even for Ghanaians like, like myself and her and him, how we come back, that there are some people whose family members are actually doing something that could be taken over and brought to the next level. And we don't even look at those opportunities. So for example, she talked about the Kinke seller and how she's like, 
of a family that she knew of that this woman selling kinky would have a long line every day, this long queue of people who were just waiting because apparently she had the best kinky and fish. So this woman was making so much money, she was able to afford paying for her kids to do university abroad. And you know, going to international university is expensive, mm -hmm. but her kinky business was able to support these kids going to school abroad. Now the kids are going to school abroad, and they don't want to come back and take over the kinky business, but that business could be something that could be generational, that could be continuing to make millions, but they look at it as like, ah, kinky selling mm -hmm. is beneath mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. university. But it's like, that kinky selling, I equate that to Colonel Sanders frying chicken mm. in the back of a gas station in the United States selling chicken. Mm. Just chicken. And mm. now but where's Kentucky Fried Chicken? All now we're KFC yes, everywhere around the world. Right. So these simple businesses could be something that, you know, people who are coming back and have family members doing it. Or if you're just coming new, you can even start something because you may understand branding. Mm -hmm. You may be able to brand it and package it in a way that becomes a huge business. Mm -hmm. And that could be something that's making you money. But we have a challenge in our society here of what I refer to as, um, you know, the long-term generational thinking. So in Ghana, because of poverty mindset, which I brought up before, we have a lack of generational thinking. Mm -hmm. And if you have generational thinking, you have people who will see the opportunity of pushing things. And this isn't only exclusive to Ghana. This is also our diaspora people who came from America, came from the UK, Australia, wherever, Canada, who don't see that you have to might sometimes make a sacrifice today for something that will be a success 50 years from now. Mm -hmm. And I often bring up the example of Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton, 150 years old, that brand started. That person, that guy was homeless, homeless, and started his suitcase business. And what, what, what happened? He was passed on to a family member, who then passed on to another family member, who passed on to another family member. Now it's the big, one of the biggest brands, conglomerates in the world. People still know the Louis Vuitton name because it had a succession plan. Right. But we have a problem in the black community, no matter where you're from. Yeah. This matter like Ghana, you're from Texas, you're from Canada, Jamaica. We have a problem with creating succession plans of our businesses so that people continue with it yes. going. Mm. Like there's, there's a fashion brand here in Ghana that was hugely successful. I'm not going to name the name um, because I know that they were going through some disputes. And when the person died, nobody's taking it over. It's, it's like 10 years now, the brand mm. has died. And it's like, if we have a succession plan, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then we have this brand continuing. And so those of us who come from the diaspora and we want to start something, we have to think, you know what? I may have to be the one who's the sacrificial lamb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I may have to be the one who is sacrificing my time, my sweat, my blood, for this to become something that maybe, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years to come, someone else is running it and it continues on. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have children, maybe you're grooming your children to take over. Mm -hmm. So we have to, we have to somehow work on that. Why is worse? And, I'm, I'm saying, and I'm, I know I have to be part of that too because mm -hmm. I have my issues and my challenges too. To this day, sometimes I feel like packing up mm -hmm. and going back to Canada, but I don't because I know that there's a purpose in in remaining. Why is mm -hmm. worse? Why is worse? Mm -hmm. So while um, you said they want to go big. I want to touch on that. A lot of people go broke because people come to Ghana and pay three thousand dollars a month in rent, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Like in a year and a half, you can build something modest. Is anybody yourself. guilty here? Please, let's, let's, yeah. let's, 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 almost there. You can, you can, you can, you can build something modest for yourself with fifty thousand dollars, and that's generational, like you said. But we want to appear so big. And we don't think long term, like you said, because if you build that for yourself, there are Indians and Lebanese that I know. Chinese. They came here, their forefathers came here when it was bush, just like you, they bought it, they, they weren't rich. Mm -hmm. Even Malcolm started that way, they're very small shop. Mm -hmm. And they passed on and passed on and passed on, and now they got Airbnbs running the kids. Mm -hmm. So we, we rather, you know, go to, you know, a fancy apartment and then, you know, look rich when we're not yes. and that's 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 yeah. the issue and you yeah. earn your cash fast whether that's fifty thousand sixty thousand seventy thousand dollars if you want to live like that in ghana two years you're out <laughs> it's so easy for a ghanaian american to rent two thousand three thousand dollars and cities no no two thousand cities uh mm -hmm. apartment than a diaspora will yeah why do you think you guys just i mean can't no 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 it's not it's just them but i'm like they choose 
because that's that's not, so because we're used awesome. to that because we're used to that right for me i said i was i'm not going to be paying no three thousand dollars a month but again me being here by myself i want to be comfortable i'm not going to compromise my living space i'm not going to come this far to be stepping back running from snakes in a bush <laughs> like, i'm not doing that I you know what i mean it. i, I see it. some people do it and it's just like all right just go back home take some money and figure it out but for me there's certain compromises i'm willing to take but my living space i need to be comfortable but you afford it i said i'm not paying three thousand okay, dollars okay. what i can afford to be comfortable in a living space for my lifestyle i'm not going to go above my means but I think for us, as, as as we're coming in, it's just what we're used to <laughs> and what we're comfortable with. Perfect. I'm not going to go above my Perfect. knees, but I'm not going to be in a bush. Oftentimes, <laughs> oftentimes we'll match our lifestyle. Right. I can imagine you running but, but at, the same <laughs> time, <laughs> at, at the same time, though, you have to manage your expectations and know where you're coming. Mm -hmm. So if you live in a five-bedroom house, in a, in a big house in America, when you come mm -hmm. here, it's actually affordable here. But you just have to take your time. Mm -hmm. I have a very nice house in East Lincoln in a gated community, and I don't pay over a thousand dollars. Been there for five years. Mm -hmm. So again, you have to take your time. Mm -hmm. yes. So I didn't short myself the luxury that I have in America. I didn't come to Ghana to reduce my live my style of living. Exactly. That wasn't the plan. Mm -hmm. Now, if I had to, the money situation was funny, and I had to, then at that point you have to sit up and say, okay. Let's manage my expectations and what I can and can't do, mm -hmm. what I will or won't do, what I can handle. Mm -hmm. And then you, you, your money follows. But the idea of us living big, we're just trying to maintain a lifestyle that we've already uh, accustomed to. Mm -hmm. right? Moving to Africa automatically, in people's world minds, like, oh, you're going to live in a hut. Mm -hmm. I show people my house, they like that. That's nicer than the house you got here. Yeah. So exactly. it's, it's available. You just have to be patient. Mm -hmm. um, Ghana has everything that you need. Ghana has every luxury that you desire. It's just, can you afford it? And are you willing to adjust it? Right. I get that part, but what I'm saying is we have other ethnicities who kind of, they were used to standards in the mm -hmm. UK or whatever, Chinese or Japanese, mm -hmm. but they gave it out. They, they stayed in their houses with cockroaches. It's like this. Yeah. Why can't you? That's because they're they about yeah. success rate. Right, right, right. 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 African American yeah. tends so, to do that a lot. So, compared to other people yeah. who sacrifice this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Let me come in with Athena and Shy Hills, that area, because that's where I operate for the most part. And there are a lot of Chinese and Lebanese there, like a lot. Mm -hmm. Indians. I said, why these guys do <clears throat> They rather go set up the factory mm -hmm. and work long term. And they're okay with in sacrificing the, bushes. the in Yeah, the they're bushes. okay. Yeah. They're okay with sacrificing that mm -hmm. for you know. That's the, that's just what I've, I've noticed. I've seen know? that too. A lot of so, Chinese have factories uh, outside yeah. of the city central, and they're that's the sacrifice that they're willing to take so, now, so that they can have those long term generational wealth. Um, yeah, but their mentality is different though. They, oh yeah, that's they, that's they, about they, it. they come with a different mean. They come. We're coming to be free. Mm. We don't necessarily think initially that we have to come to build a manufacturing. And when we get here, we see, oh, y'all have fish on the map, we need this. But initially, we're coming to just breathe. Mm. Mm. Do, do you think that is at our detriment? It, especially if you are an African American who don't ha who doesn't have any ties here, do you feel like you can come here? I mean, everybody has the right to do what they want to, to be honest with you. No, but you don't have to be come to Ghana and do business. You can come to Ghana to live a quiet life and enjoy yourself. So I don't think there's any type of lifestyle you should think you should have, just to get that clear. Um, but. Do, do you feel that sometimes in us coming to breathe and enjoy for a little while, we miss the opportunity to really put that into something substantial for us? But see, y'all got to remember, this is a foreign land to us. Mm. You're used to this. So when we come... Me? I'm not. I'm not. You're used to this. You have a reference. The thing is, is that I think... Um, I'm not talking for all African-Americans, because mm -hmm. I don't know all African-Americans, but because I'm from the UK and I, ha I know where I'm from and have ties, doesn't make me any more comfortable comfortable in being in Ghana maybe than you do although I know my mom you yeah, do it and come it does I, I, it I does, feel, it does. I, okay in terms of me coming here I, I will still face the same challenges as you in terms of your references and your 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 comfort zone is different okay please explain that um do you speak Chui at all N not necessarily no I only know um, does your family speak Chui in your house 
Um, you know, it's been, I don't understand you. Whenever my mum talks to you, I say, please speak English. <laughs> Okay. But no, 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 I'm not trying to be difficult. But I understand what you're okay, saying. Okay, so, like, so just language like, barrier first. Right? Language barrier. Secondly, you have relatives here at some point. I, I have relatives here, but the people I trust is my mom and my uncle. Of course, but yeah. you, if anything happened to you, you have family in the country. Yeah. Okay, that's, that, that, is, that is a comfort. <laughs> and like, whether you use it or not or agree, that's a comfort zone. Like you said, yeah. our parents are at home. Yeah. I can't run to anybody related yeah. to me here. Okay. I was and just also mentioned call. that your auntie so, had a business so, that you were going to take over. Like, well, you my auntie, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so, 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 so right. we're just so, coming in blindly. Blind. Okay, me, I understand. Okay. That's <laughs> a big difference. Let me come real quick. Make that clear. What, what you said, I really liked it, that some people just want to breathe and come and relax. Mm -hmm. In doing so, you should prepare well. Yeah. And set up some sort of residual income, because Dana is not cheap. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy to make money yet. When you figure it out, there is a lot of money to be made, but it's not easy when you start it. So if you just want to, I agree, not everybody is, you know, meant to come and create a whole bunch of businesses and make money. Some people just want to fight life, but you don't want to stop. No, you so play. if that's your goal, then make sure that, you know, you know, some people come here with their retirement. If you build your house, you live a fantastic life. Ghana is the life. great place for pension <laughs> Americans. If you have a check coming, if exactly. you need military yeah. service, if you're exactly. retired, yes. exactly. if you have it all figured out, you got a necessary Good. amount coming yeah. in that you know, yeah. you're able to budget, you're Good. able to guide, and yeah. then you can then expand exactly. when you want. Good. So for the person like me now, who's moving at a younger age than a retired age, that used to be the, ex, the, the diaspora community here, the retirees, now you're getting younger people. I've moved here. In my early 40s, I'm not retired. I don't have a pension yet. So that means I'm still hustling and bustling and, and really, you know, trying to figure out what to do. And when you get here, you become the hustle man because it's not one thing that's going to take care of everything. Right. Unless you have something set up in the States that is coming Ooh. back. Working remote, perfect. If you have a remote job, come on. It's, you know, it's the you know, best. It's, it's actually the yeah. best <laughs> and the easiest because other than that, you have to do something like be in Wall Street, make money get some dividends and oh, all yeah, that. Oh yeah, about a strong Wi-Fi and you got your check coming. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that's, the, that's the easiest. You can live the life. That's the easiest. That's the, that's the easiest. If you're coming easiest. to make your money, you have to plan very well. And you can do it. You just have to stick to the plan and be willing to be palm trees. Exactly. Then, not break. Yes. Because things are going to change. And it goes back to when you were saying take your time. Because that's something that I tell people too. Absolutely. Take your time when you're researching yeah. if you want to live in Ghana. And come, I usually tell people, come and stay for at least one month. One month. Yeah. Because one month gives you enough time to really... Get out the tours though. Right. And it's outside and of come, December. And come one month. <laughs> That is not a month of getting lit. And yeah, outside outside of no, no December. Just come outside. because you have a purpose yeah. to research and figure yeah. out what you want to do. One of the things that we don't think about as black people, and, and, and it's not something I really thought about until recently, I started watching a lot of podcasts that talk about money and finance because mm -hmm. I'm getting older and yeah. I'm just like, I need to start making really, really making real yes. money so that I can prepare for later years of life. And so, one of the things we don't think about is acquiring businesses. That I've been watching videos where there's like white people who are rich and talk about how they make their wealth acquiring other businesses. And I started really paying attention to that because of how I see that company BlackRock just buys everybody out. And um, one particular woman was saying how she looks for easy businesses that have guaranteed income because there are things that people do every day and need the money to do those things. And they'll always do those things whether there's a recession or not, right. recession through businesses. And so she was talked about how she bought a car wash. And he mentioned car wash, she bought a car wash. She's like, if people are driving cars, they're always gonna clean their car, they're always gonna need a detail, they want the inside vacuum and all that kind of stuff. It's an easy setup and somebody's already doing it, maybe they don't want to do it anymore. So she says she looks up businesses where the person is older, mm. they're close to retirement, they don't have anybody to take over, and then she buys the business. Mm. And then it's an easy turnkey, just buy business it, and necessity. Going. Yeah. So, so that's something we can research. Yeah. If you come to Ghana, maybe there's a business that you see someone's getting older, nobody wants to take over, and you can buy the business, and then you continue and grow the business. I think mm. it's, something that it's a good one, too. because that's exactly what I did. Uh, they were already operating a car wash. I didn't sell the car wash from scratch. Mm. They were operating it. And there were a lot of car washes on the street. But I, I noticed that he, his, it wasn't in shape. Like if he had the money, he would probably put it in a better shape or he wasn't managing well or something like that. And so I observed and I went straight to him and he was desperately trying to sell. 
Wow. So when I went there, it was like we had a, like, a conversation for like five minutes, literally. That was it. Mm -hmm. He's been trying to sell already. I just showed up. You know, it is so, so many businesses like that. Even yeah. like Ashford, we have communities now that are retirees that started businesses and restaurants, and they're looking for us to come back and like take over. Yeah. So you just be surprised. Um, one of the Cape Coast restaurants just did that uh, when our diaspora families just finally have a secession plan that worked. That was a Black American that came in and and, and, and re reinvented the, the brand. And Do you guys think, think we have a cultural gap between Black? Um, Diasporans and then Black Africans. Absolutely. Yeah, the people are different everywhere based on the experience you have, based on the culture you experience. Mm -hmm. Somebody who whose history is through the, the trafficking, transatlantic slave trade, their their experiences are going to be different than someone who has lineage to a country in Africa, and also a Black person who lived in Europe is going to have a different experience than a Black person who lived in Canada, who lived in Australia. In each of these places, we have the connected and similar black experience of the racism that we all experience as black people living outside of the continent. We all have had some experience, whether it's systematic or it's in your face. Mm -hmm. That is one thing that connects us all that we cannot deny. Um, whether you haven't got a job because you're black, whether you've got some racist who hates you because you're black, we've all experienced that around the world. Yeah. That is one commonality. Um, but the differences come in cultural references because of where you lived. If you lived in France, a black France experience is going to be a little bit different than a UK black experience versus a Canada black experience versus the African American, the Brazilian. Yeah. We all have different experiences because of the cultures that we've adopted based on where we ended up. Whether you ended up there by choice because your parents moved somewhere and brought you, um, then you were born there, raised there, or if you were displaced by no fault of your own because of history. We all have different experiences and we all have to learn from each other and try to understand each other. Because I think our biggest problem as black people around the world is our division. Mm -hmm. And our division has resulted because we don't understand each other and sometimes we don't take the time to understand each other. Why should I say that I know more than you do because your family lineage is Jamaica and America? Why do I don't know more than you do because you have a different experience. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a different experience as black UK people have a different experience. And I have learned more about, I have learned more about different black people here. living in Ghana yeah. over the last um, eight consecutive years than I ever have mm -hmm. because I have met and, and interacted with people from different parts of the world like I never I met, I met people from Suriname I never thought I would meet someone some, from Suriname and telling us about the black experience as Surinamese people who have the Dutch influence and all the stuff they experience mm -hmm. African Americans have always had connections with them because living at the Canadian border and crossing all the time, I, I always had the African American understanding. So that one was never new for me. But the others, like the black British one, there's a lot of differences with black British experience. So how do you, how do you bridge that? Uh, conversation. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. a lot and, of the and division. Having a desire to understand. And, and, and taking the time to listen to each other. And everybody's story is unique. But we have to respect each other's experience and story. Like, like you just said, my story is not better than yours because I'm in America yeah. as opposed to Canada. Yeah. I think understanding that the division was intentional. Yeah, very intentional. And, and propaganda behind it. So how do you guys view or see an abstract American by way of what was told to you is not the truth. Mm -hmm. yes. So us being here in the face of you needing educated, non-violent, non-drug addict, non-ghetto mm -hmm. non black people, hopefully would change whatever perception that the media and propaganda mm -hmm. wanted you to know about. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, we have, we have to want to, to understand we're different. Because one of the things I used to get from African Americans is that I wasn't black enough because of the way I speak. Mm -hmm. Like, why are you talking like that? Why are you speaking so proper? Like, in Buffalo, New York, is mm -hmm. where a lot of the time is spent, because I was 15 minutes from the New York State Board. Buffalo, New York, Niagara Falls, New York, when I was around a lot of those people, Rochester, New York. Um, who would say that, or even when I went to New York City a lot, New York, New Jersey, I spent a lot of time on the eastern side of the United States, and then eventually Midwest when I lived in Detroit. And that was the one thing I would always get from African Americans, is that I wasn't black enough because of the way I speak. And I'm like, the way I speak has to do with where I lived. It doesn't have to do with my identity as a black person. Because still, if we are, if I'm standing in a room, you're standing in rooms, and there's some KKK racist person standing there, they're not going to say, oh, oh you're black. Man, no, you're from here, you're from there. They right. just see a black person. And so exactly. at the end of the day, we should just understand our differences, you know? And even within Canada, mm -hmm. I had somebody, I remember um, when I was in university, we went, we did this outreach to high schools to talk to young black kids 
in neighborhoods that had challenges about you know, the power of education. And when I was speaking, at the end when they did the Q&A session, some kid put up his hand and said, I don't know anything about being black. Listen to how I'm speaking. And I'm like, are you for real? Mm. He's telling me I don't know anything about being black because of the way I'm speaking. Because in Toronto, there's communities where you have pockets of people who um, are, there's a lot of Caribbeans, um, who were dominant at that time. There was African communities, but a lot of Africans were afraid to admit they were Africans because they would get made fun of. So they would pretend they were Caribbean, even though they weren't. So you have this Caribbean situation where the person saying, because I'm not speaking the, the slang, um, which I discovered that Canadian Caribbean slang is very similar to the UK because of the Caribbean influence. And so um, I was like, really? You think I haven't had a black experience because of where I'm speaking? Mm -hmm. I was like, were you called the N-word going to school every day? I'm like, you're living amongst your black people in your community in Toronto. I lived as like most of the time being the only black person in my class. Because my dad put up, we went to school in the white side of the city. The city was predominantly white. I grew up in St. Catharines, which is a place where Harriet Tubman lived. A lot of Americans don't know that because they hide history from us. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that was a sidebar. <laughs> so, I was like, I even called the N-word going to school every day, getting on the bus, me and my brother getting on the school bus, people saying the dirty kids are getting on the bus, covering their noses, saying they smell because they're dirty. Every day, for a while. Wow. I had a kid who was calling me the N-word, always, always like tormenting me, and I had to deal with that. And I would go home and talk, talk to my mom, and she'd be like, oh, don't worry about them, don't worry about them, just, you know, mm -hmm. just be strong. And... Going through that, yeah, I went through black, black experiences mm -hmm. as a black person. Right. So to be accused by one of my own black people that mm -hmm. I don't know what it's like to be a black person just because of the way I speak. But we get that here. We, we get that here. We so, we're, so I've never been called white. I've heard nothing about me as white. It's crazy. Um, but because of the way I talk, I'm a broody. A broody. And, yeah. I, and I had to break it down. I had to ask. I said, yeah. Now, I brought a broody before, and I had some fair skin black people. A lot of times, the complexion variety isn't understood here, and I get it. Um, but to call a black person from the States white is so insulting. And we yeah. have to like mm -hmm. dive into, like, what, Why it's where do you see? What yes. do you see that yes. makes you say, I am white? Yes. And they say, simply, ah, the way you okay. talk. <laughs> so it's all about, it, it's a perception thing. Yeah. Yeah. So whether you're in the States and you talk proper, um, and, and that's also a perception thing in propaganda. They want black Americans to think that you only supposed to talk like, yo, this, that, and the other. But most of us have proper education and can, and can switch. Right. And, can do both. Oh, and, and, and even with proper education doesn't mean that I have to speak in a certain way. Like, as a black person, they box us and say we should do this. Uh, there's different ty types of black people. I could love rock music. I could love... Um, I, I shouldn't be boxed by the culture. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people box black people by the culture and we don't have to stick to that mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of us um, uniting, in terms of us having different experiences, I feel like building communities are very important. But what I find is that as a, um, a African British person, black British person, there's not, I don't feel like, the, correct me if I'm wrong, the African American community um, really opens up their doors to other black communities. Yeah, can we talk like about that? There's a lot of African, African American, this African American. I'm not hating on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit. I wish there was more like British stuff as well. But I feel like there's a lot of African American, this, oh, we could only have African Americans coming to this. And, uh, like, so we're, like, never, we're never exclusive. Like, but yes, you're right. Like, like, you know, to us as well. guess what? <laughs> because we don't have the family that should. Exactly. We, have to we don't have the tribe. We don't family. have this community. We have to intentionally and it's happening right now, create it guys have so that life. when we have an influx of mm -hmm. thousands of people coming every month, mm -hmm. hey, we're right here, y'all. Y'all tribe is on the ground. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, all black. No, 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 I know, but at the same time, yes. we, have, we have a community as well. According to my research, a lot of African Americans don't merge themselves into the local communities like the other ethnicities do. Why do you guys think that is? I think it's ignorance. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, think you know, it's an adjustment period. Again, yeah, we this is a foreign land. We, we don't, don't trust share. people because I was gonna say it's true. We heard true. things that happened, we have witnesses, we have stories online, we got our own personal stories. You know what I mean? So I think it's a trust factor, I think it's a communication factor, I think it's 
a lack of um, places for us to talk and learn each other. Um, I'm very, my neighbors are Ghanaian and they all know me very well. I throw birthday parties for the kids in my house. Like, we definitely try to assimilate within our own comfort zones. And um, African American Association of Ghana is one of the organizations that have been here for a long time. Um, over 40 years, 30 years, right? And, um, and one of our things is we invite our names to be members. And a lot of us are like, well, why are we doing that? <laughs> because we literally want to make sure that we have our own corner too. Um, but at the same time, we're here to assimilate and we want to educate each other about each other. So places aren't exclusive, but yes, we do have our own because we need our own. Our community is needed. I, I think it's amazing. I think everybody needs their own. If you're from like um, Asia and you have your own, it's, it's necessary. Yeah, they have it. Um, <laughs> Uh, but what I find, I'm not attacking mm -hmm. African Americans. I've been around African Americans that have just moved. Sometimes, <clears throat> what I've seen, I feel that they feel like they're better. For example, I was at a restaurant. I'm not doing this for anything, but the, 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 the beauty standards. In Ghana, if you are a woman, you are beautiful, period. A man will find you attractive. And there was a lady, she was a plus size woman, dark skin, and then a man was in front of her, she was eating, he was giving her all the attention. And the family that I was with, because we had like a play date, um, looked at her, they looked at the side like, look at her, like, look at this obese woman. And I feel that sometimes the integration is because sometimes, um, not maybe just African Americans, but people that come in here, maybe they feel like they are better. And I've seen, I've seen that. And you, you're not gonna win if you think you're better because Ghanaians, even though they may have the poverty mentality, they are very smart. Mm. And there's a lot you can learn from Ghanaians. Mm. <laughs> so um, I feel that we, we, it's in our best interest for your association to integrate Ghanaians because if they're on your side, they will open the doors for you. We, I feel like a lot of people feel that because we're from abroad, we open the doors, no. If a Ghanaian person likes you, they will open the doors for you. Mm. If they don't like you, no matter if you have the accent or the dollar, the door will remain shut. Absolutely. Mm. I would yeah. say from my experience, right, because I, I'm a loner, right, but I am very mindful of who I allow my space, and I think it definitely does have a lot to do with trust. So when we come in, right, because we have trust issues coming from America as a black person, period. And when we come in, I'm gonna seek for myself. My intention is pure. I'm looking at you as a friend, right? I'm in your country, how can we connect? How can we work? How can I help you? Vice versa. And there's been a lot of times that I would trust in someone and they betrayed me, mm. right? And, and it would be a Ghanaian woman mm. where I'm like, I'm thinking we're friends. So I think from my experience, it's been I, I, I don't think I'm better than anyone, but I do believe that sometimes they think that we think we're better than Facts. them, mm -hmm. right? So I, I could be in a club and the guys are in my face and then she's jealous because of that. Mm -hmm. But it's like, girl, if I'm getting the bottles, we getting the bottles together. Like, I'm not mad at it. When my friends come into town and that's the thing, mm -hmm. I'm not jealous of her either. It's just, mm -hmm. we're in this together. So again, I think it's a cultural thing for us as when it comes to trust. My own personal experience, um, I think that I'm pretty open with my staff. I'm, I'm going based off of the interaction that I've been having with Ghanaians. You can ask them. I think they love me just as much as I love them. Um, but I don't, speaking for myself, I don't come here thinking I'm better than them. I think anyone. it's implied. I think when we're coming from the country, countries, yeah. I have plenty of Ghanaians, about 10. Mm. Better than my phone that I speak to very well, but they, all different different reasons and different purposes um, with different in, in, engagements but i think that is an implied betterment mm -hmm. when you're coming from a country that everyone wants to get to and we've made it here no, and we left it that's, that's what they think we're that's major. they think we're max right we're leaving the, the place of golden streets right mm -hmm. so automatically if an african or anyone in this country in goal of life is to get to a place where we decided to get out mm -hmm. It's an implied, it's not necessarily, we necessarily walk that way, but the African may think that way no matter what we do. Because they want to get to where we have left, or where we're from, or where we call home. So I think that's, again, one of the cultural differences that we have. There's a lot of implied 
um, references in our head that we don't really understand. Yeah. On the trust thing. In our own country, we don't trust people like that. So why do we come to Africa and feel like we can trust people? Oh, because we think it's too bad. The African Americans come back with too bad our heart. We are back. We are at home. We are back in Africa. Oh, my people. And we get burnt really quickly with that. Do you guys have any regrets so far after moving and relocated? I would have saved more money before moving. Same. Mm. That's the one thing. Save more money before moving to mm -hmm. Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the things that all of us who've lived abroad, no matter what your lineage is, when you've lived abroad for the majority of your life, you are used to a system where there's a credit system. Mm -hmm. So a lot of Ghanaians don't realize that most people who they think are rich abroad are surviving because of the credit system. That's right. So you have access to loans, you have access to credit cards, you have access to any payment plans that allow you to have the kind of lifestyle you're having. So in, whereas when you come to Ghana, there's, there's not a credit system, so you're not used to being um, put in a position where you have to do everything with cash up front. For example, everybody's like, hey, you want to go, bring me a phone, bring me a phone, but they don't understand. Most <laughs> <laughs> like, people are getting their cell phone on contract. That's right. So it's like, you're, you're in the U.S., you're on Verizon, you're on AT&T, you're in Canada, you're on Browsers, you're on Bell, whatever, and you are paying a monthly fee for your phone on top of whatever your phone bill is. And then when you're paid off at the end of your what one or two year contract, and then the phone belongs to you. Once the phone belongs to you, at least in Canada, the phone company will call you and be, hello, Mr. Prosper, you've just paid off your phone. You're eligible for an upgrade. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, I can get the latest phone? Yes, and you only pay this much per month. And you're like, okay, you get a new phone and you're paying by month. But the Ghanaian thinks you've just paid you know, $1,000 for a brand new phone, but it's like, no, dude, yeah. I'm getting a month to month payment mm -hmm. to pay off this phone. When someone wants a car, when I got my car, when I was I was manager of a, of a shoe store, I got my car because I made a certain salary that allowed me to get the car under a monthly payment. So I made my monthly payments until my car was paid off. So whereas here, someone will pay cash up front for that car. So they think everybody there is living the same way they live here, not knowing that we're living that lifestyle because because when you guys come, come back, you so when we come heavy. here, mm -hmm. it's a challenge because you're like, oh, switching yeah, systems. I need to do this, but I have to pay full cash up front to do yes. this in order to get this done. Even if you have, let's say, you have to fix your roof in your house, you have to fix something that's spoiled in your house that's broken. You could be like, okay, make your monthly payments to fix this roof, but you gotta like, hey, you have to pay fifteen thousand. Uh, you have to pay it all. We they want seventy percent up front, and then when we finish, you pay the rest. And you're like, what? Yeah. So. It makes it harder for us mm -hmm. when we're used to that system. I know that they're introducing mortgages and stuff here, um, but the interest rates are absolutely ridiculous. Like 30%, between between 29 to like 35%. Who wants to pay that? If you pay in dollars, you can get 12%. 12%. We're used to four. I mean, I know, I'm, just, say, yeah, I'm right. just letting people know. I mean, I'm never gonna go for that, but I, I, I know someone paying 12%, so I just want them to know that. Uh, yeah. The is there. yeah. But in general, yeah. generally speaking, most places, the interest rate it's is crazy. really high in Ghana. So most people will be like, let me just save, them, save up the money and, and pay it. the cash up front. And then they even want a lot of these loans in Ghana, they want collateral. They want to like, what collaterals do you have? Like, do you have land? Do you have this? Do you have that? Before they even give you the loan. And they're so, still bureaucratic with it. Like, you go, you go to hell. This mortgage I'm talking about, I'm not going to say the name, but I was, I was involved. I was the part of Tony, and um, they had to do physical. Physical, like you're not going to die soon mm -hmm. to get approved. Sure. And that blew my mind, like, wow. Yeah, wow. it's, a, it's, it's yeah. new, it's a new system. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. I'm like, how careful do you want to be? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is crazy. You have to run through hoops, because I, I, you know, I'm looking at um, starting a business, and, and I went to the bank to see what they offered here, and I remember that the bank was like, oh, they offer loans if you're getting a salary from a company that's banking with them because then they can just take the money direct without having to worry about where they're getting the money from you and know? they still get to 25 percent yeah they, they said they said 34 percent is what they said so um so yeah so 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 for that reason i would advise people save up enough money before you move to ghana so that you have money that you can access for some of the things you need to do right yeah right. but in right. saying that don't try and make everything perfect because you will never have enough i was just about to <laughs> I'm, like, I'm gonna i'm gonna be i'm gonna be i'm gonna be i'm gonna be maybe one month living i'm gonna i'm gonna be very open here because you don't want to say i need 
50,000 dollars. I wouldn't really take it to 60,000. Some people, Americans have more money than the UK people. That's what I think. That's why they can see all people to live a, No, no, no. They live a lifestyle that the British people cannot afford. And cherry out to you guys. But yeah, like. I, I would like to come in with a saving. I think it's great. You should definitely save. But I came here with like. I'm very open with it because I lost the money in the stock market anyways. I'll go with it. I came with like seven hundred thousand dollars cash. Who has seven hundred thousand dollars? I'm telling you, and I still, I still went through it. So I'm telling, I'm telling you that saving, this is the answer for me. Saving is not, it's not it. So I, I lost a big chunk of the money in the stock market. I bought this business for like, I spent like hundred and ten thousand dollars, and then I locked up in court for two years. Now I'm back the making much. Yes. Wow. Yes. So it ended up in court for two years. So I'm saying that I'm just trying to. You can save a lot of money, but it's better to have a plan. <coughs> that's actually giving you the money that you know, okay, this money is coming every month. Because that's what saved me. I would have been gone. Mm -hmm. Good point. It was the money coming in. I came with all this money, and what I was trying to do was not working. You can come with the money, you think, oh, you are trying to buy, you bought the land, you're trying to build this apartment, the land was a scam, you bought, now what? Mm -hmm. So I think it's best to plan. plan and try to set up something. Like you say, come in and out, you set something, you know it's working. And then having money is good, too, but. It does not guarantee that you will you will be okay because mm -hmm. I came with all this money and I almost went back. Yeah, it was the residual income that saved me. Right, identifying identifying what is needed, which goes back to spending time here. Identify what is needed in Ghana or abroad that you think you can make into a lucrative business mm -hmm. that will always bring you money. Because one of the things on the ground is the simple things can make you a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, like I, I know someone who from high school had said that she knew a woman who came to Ghana and was selling um, soy milk. And that was before Ghana was selling soy milk. Uh, you see soy milk around now, but mm -hmm. she was one of the first people to bring it into the country and became a millionaire bringing soy milk into Ghana. So you can find the simplest things to be like, Oh, what do people want? And then that can be your niche that you're working in while maybe doing other things. But the best is when you have money coming from abroad because you have dollars coming in or pounds, whatever it may be, that can also sustain you. And the, the good thing right now is that we're in a time where remote work is possible. There's a lot of companies now that after the COVID pandemic recognize that it is possible to work remotely. You don't have to be there. So I know of a lot of people who came in 2020 and ended up staying because they were able to work remotely in their work while still um, getting money from the companies abroad. So that's one way that you can always do, as long as you're willing to be flexible with your time zone, because some people don't realize that, yes, you can be making money abroad, but if you're in Ghana, you're still working on, maybe you're working on the East Coast. West Coast time or East Coast time, you may be eight hours behind, and then you have to work that in Ghana. I had someone who was complaining about it, he was like, man, He's like, I got to work at this time into the late night because it's the time you know, back there. I guess the easiest would be if you're on UK time zone mm -hmm. with the work. I don't think that's it. I don't have any regrets, but I think that, um, you know, especially for the diaspora coming from America and the islands, we are the first of our whole lineage to come back. So you don't have the room or the opportunity to have regrets. You have to just learn from your lessons and keep moving mm -hmm. so that you have a lot of people behind you watching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of generations behind you depending on you making it. Mm -hmm. So if you come on the right reasons and you're here for the right purposes, um, it's, it's all in play. You know, you go back to the civil rights leaders, like they never had it easy. Mm -hmm. But if they didn't do it, we wouldn't be where we are. Right. So we feel that we're like the, 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 the chosen ones to yeah. deal with the, the yeah. wild. I love the it. Wild. That's, so that's that it. we can stay strong and fix it and tell people, no, don't do it that way. No, don't do it that way. Plan out. Have a three month phase. Come for a month. Don't move on your first time. Tap into Triple AG or your, your group that's here. Find your niche. Find your all the things that we can tell you because we had to figure it out ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's the one advantage that you do have. You don't have to do so those that are coming from the diaspora that have nothing here on the ground, the first feet that are touching in lineages since enslaved Africans were transported in slave traffic, I'm sorry, human traffic, human trafficking to America, we have nothing here. So this is just us raw in, in raw form, um, in raw learning processes, learning to trust, learning how to read. Integrate ourselves in a culture that was wrong. Unlearn. Right. We right. have to unlearn what we were taught about you. We have to tell you guys and show you guys who we really are and not who we were told that we were mm -hmm. or are. Right. So it's a lot of work to be done. And now that we're here, it's time to do it. Mm -hmm. And it has to be conversations like this 
um, dialogues that go over myths, demystifying all the things that we think about y'all are told, and vice versa, because it's a lot. And then we can work to be one and be more assimilative and be all the things we talked about today. Will you, will you, will you guys, guys say it's all been worth it after yep. all this I would, I would, definitely. I have no regrets, uh, including, you know, all the issues that I encountered along the way. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely, you know, educated me um, and made me stronger. I'm actually happy that whatever happened, happened. Mm -hmm. and yes, I'm in a better position now. That I would have been if I bought a land and everything went smoothly. Mm -hmm. I would I would just would have operated that, built a minimum and stayed like that. But now I have, like, as a five business, it's all because, you know, this guy puts straight mouse on my brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so you have to yeah. do that. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy. I don't I have no regrets. Yeah, I don't have any regrets either. Sorry, I don't have any regrets either. I think it's we have the responsibility of being the first ones here. So we are taking all the punches, right? And it's building us to be stronger. But the fact that we're here now at this point in time, I'm the pioneer, right? So I have younger cousins that come and visit, right? My youngest was like six when she first came and they're looking to see what can i do in ghana what where else in africa can i go right for me when i was six i'm like ah, i want to go there <laughs> and so i'm now changing the mindset of younger black african americans to come now and see for yourself camden you, you know camden right he's investing in he's looking to get one of the apartments here so we hold the responsibility we are taking the punches and we were chosen yeah. right so god put me here for a reason i got the vision that i got for a reason so i don't have any regrets regardless of if i was doing a nine to five or going to school i would face obstacles and that's how i look at it so wherever you go in the world you're going to face something but i have the luxury of creating the life that i want here on the continent and also being with so many beautiful black people. I am part of 50 people, you know, like about 10 full time, and then the rest is contractors on site and stuff like that. So um, I have no regrets. I mean, even if I was making, but that's not the case, Ghana, I'm making more money in Ghana than I was making the states except the stock market. Um, <laughs> with a lot less stress and only my time and paying no rent. I pay like uh, $12 in electricity because I have solar. So I, I literally like you keep all the money. It is amazing. Mm -hmm. If you can you figure can it out, this the place to be. Honestly. Yeah, just start small. Yeah. When you have your foundation set, it can be so beautiful. You yes. just gotta be patient with yourself and work patient with Ghana, patient with Ghanaians, well. understand where you are and don't come here with that Western mentality. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come here with that mentality as far as like work. Like to right. get things done. I don't mind being chased by snakes. Manage your expectations. Manage your expectations by coming to a third world country or an undeveloped country from a westernized country. It's gonna be it's gonna be a difference. Yeah. So what is that difference mean? Without without you seeing it first, without you coming to ex experience it, you don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, you really have to be true with yourself the it's a humbling question can i do this mm -hmm. is what i'm going through over here worth this you know and then from there you can build whatever you want but right. you have to be patient plan it out tap into your resources there are resources on ground mm -hmm. don't do anything by yourself mm -hmm. ask questions that's, that's what, where you so, fail that's what the foreigners do they stay together mm -hmm. the chinese will be in that i i say <coughs> when you see them you see them in packs. yes yeah. they move together they sell together they buy together and one thing i noticed about these guys i'm gonna throw this one out there maybe you guys will you guys will find it useful so i work with people who have a lot of land and sometimes you know land cases whether the land is yours or not somebody's trying 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 you mm -hmm. so they usually go to the police headquarters these guys when they're coming for land they go to the police headquarters mm -hmm. and ask you who's the rightful owner why because already they investigated them mm -hmm. so i'm like wow mm -hmm. so they'll point you to the right owner so you're not going to get scammed in the process mm -hmm. so they have their ways of going about things and they understand that Look, it's Ghana. Mm -hmm. There's some palm greasing. Mm -hmm. When we come, when it be black and white, when I first came here, I was, I was very hot-headed. But now I understand. <laughs> you go in under, you hey, gotta, hey. You gotta hey. understand this is, this, what, this, this, is, this is what it is on the ground. So, For me, I, um, my, my regret is still not saving enough money. And it's still something I will still tell people to make sure you have enough money when you're coming um, to help support your transition period. So with that being said, 
overall, I don't have a regret because I have been responsible for being a part of changing the narrative of Africa. Yeah. And I'm very proud of that because I grew up in an environment where people made fun of us for being African people, where people had the image of everywhere in Africa, everybody is starving, everybody is poor, everybody has disease, and there's war and conflict everywhere, is the image that everybody had. When, I, when my mom would go on vacation in Ghana, she would have her coworkers asking her to take pictures of lions, and she's like, lions in Ghana? Like, what, what, what? There's this assumption that the continent is a whole monolith when there's so many different things in every country, every community, culture, food, there's so many different things. There's rich and there's poor, just like there is in America. There are homeless people here, just like there are homeless people in America and in Canada and, and in the UK. So I'm very proud of being a part of showing a different side of the continent of Africa, of making people think, oh, this could be a place that I can live, or this could be a place that I can go on vacation. Because it's not for everyone to move here. Amen. For a lot of people, it's just to come on vacation. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because people go on vacation in London, they go to Paris, they go to Barcelona, they go to wherever. Why not choose to come to Accra, choose to come to Tamale, go to Bogatanga, go to Takrade. Why not choose those places for vacation? So, or go to Hohoi, Keta. It's very important that we understand that changing the narrative of Africa is what all of us are doing. Absolutely. In our own different way. Yeah. And I'm very proud of that. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Thank I love it. It's a good one. And I think my only mistake mm. was not investing in Ghana. Earlier. Yeah. Yes. Because you know, Earlier. I was younger. I, the way that I was spending money, I, I had savings, thousands, and I don't know where it's gone. Like I want, I want the older generation to tell the younger ones back there, with your own full time salary, come on, start putting that money to work now. Like that's my only that regret. All the Gucci <laughs> shoes, that was like a part of line this year, bro. Yeah. The Gucci shoes, the low belts. Yeah. So uh, definitely, yeah. I think I bought my land for five thousand dollars when I was twenty. Mm -hmm. And okay, let me come here. Twenty. Yeah, I mean, so that's the thing. Like, I, I, I came to it. visit. <laughs> <laughs> I came. I came to visit, and then my father's friend who used to take us to the embassy. And this is this is just uh, to make get you thinking. Whoever is watching this, and I never thought about moving to Ghana. Like it wasn't part of my paradigm. Like you come here, you come here to. Basically, live for a couple of years and you die in retirement. That was the thing. Like, people right. moving here at our life. age, mm -hmm. never heard of never it, heard didn't know anybody. It. Like, you're crazy. So, it wasn't part of my thinking. But my father's friend said, You should buy land. You just never know. This is your homeland. For whatever reason, it just went straight in. So, when I went back, like four months later, I bought the land. I had no idea what I was going to do on the land. It was bare land. But when I decided to move, you know, the story is too long, but when I decided to move to some investment opportunities and stuff, the place was already developed. I didn't have to go look for land again in the bush. Mm -hmm. If if I wanted to <laughs> for snakes to chase me. So I just came and built on it. So you just never know if you are from here, home is home. So invest early. Mm -hmm. I was buying a lot of Gucci belts and Louis Vuitton stuff Stop before it. this came in. And when I was making money, that's what I was doing. And I look back, I'm like, ah. You know, now that I know about all these things, like I could have done so much, but yeah, that's but 20, cool. that's impressive. Yeah, I was in Ghana, but because you had the that elder exactly. that was here, you had the uncle, know, that resource that. that pulled you aside. So you, don't have advice. Advice. So you exactly. do have a really big advantage mm -hmm. of being a consonant of returning Africa because you got the inside school. Mm -hmm. I have a question for absolutely. <laughs> I mean, did you guys vote this, this election? For oh, right? yeah, oh, it should have. It I was absolutely, absolutely I voted. I yeah. voted before I left and we're gonna see what happened. Now I voted and I ran. I ran to Ghana. Now, my last question is this is going to be the only politics question I have for you guys. Do you think that this election would affect the exodus of black people relocating into the country? Absolutely. Yes. I, I, I think so. I don't think anything is going to stop it. I think uh, the West is changing, everything is changing, people are waking up. Um, Unless there is war, and I don't think that's going to happen. There's not going to be any war. In I think it's. So. I think it'll. It will encourage more. Depending on the outcome, oh. it will encourage more people to come. Great. Mm. To I don't think the outcome um, matters at this point. I think that the, the influx the, the influx is happening. Um, you know, when Trump won last time, mm -hmm. it really engaged a lot of new, not even new, but 
resting racism that came out. Mm -hmm. And that's what brought me here. Mm -hmm. So even if Trump wins again, it's a, it, he's not, but even if he wins again, there's a, there's a sleeping giant in America mm -hmm. that, is, that is awoken by certain yeah. leaders. Mm -hmm. And then also, if, if Harris wins, that's going to be even a, a larger call to the sleeping giants. Mm -hmm. So no matter who wins, America and diaspora from America will still be coming more mm. because either way mm -hmm. it's going to still be awakening even deeper than what we already have experienced. But so they might not come to Ghana. They could yeah, anywhere. just yeah. anywhere else. Because after the last Trump election, yeah. there's people who went to Canada. Everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's people who went to Canada. Because it's right next it's door. It's the black yeah. exodus happening. It's right next door. And, that's and they, you don't, Americans don't need a visa to go to Canada, a mm -hmm. tourist visa, so they can go there and use the six months to explore, mm -hmm. to find opportunities. Yeah. And so, yeah. So so there's a, something called a black exodus. Exodus is happening. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's we will always be where we're from. You can't take that away from us. Mm -hmm. I'm always American, but I don't have to be in America. Um, I'm comfortable and more and safer outside of America. So I think a lot of more people will feel that way and move around talk, the world. Talk about safer. I almost got shot twice by police in America. Mm -hmm. Twice. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I was very flashy, I said, yeah. you know, <laughs> so they thought I was a drug dealer, you know, and, and all that. But that's but another conversation, because when Africans go, you're not African in America. Mm -hmm. You're still black. Twice. You're another black. word. Mm -hmm. Twice. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Twice. Mm -hmm. so, so, so it, it is for us to convince our brothers, black brothers in the diaspora to invest in Africa. It's very important. Um, I think cool. that uh, we can't force anybody to do what they don't want to do with their money. Mm. At the end of the day, people will do what they want. But I think um, sharing the potential is what's most important because I think what people have to see an African country as is what was America like in 1900, mm -hmm. 1901, 1902. When some of these companies were just starting out, they started at a low grassroots level because the U.S. wasn't what it is today right. back then. So look at Ghana as that now, because as, as Deja said earlier about Ghana being only was 67 years old, is it's a young country. And there are some things that are young enough that you can get into it and then you can be responsible for helping with the growth. So for people who are looking to invest in an African country, looking at it as a potential for growth for the future and not something that you're just jumping into easily now. Because even stuff you try to invest in in America or in, you know in the West in general, it'll be hard because things are saturated. You know, you already have that one, two percent of people who are controlling a lot of the stuff and it's hard for you to get in. So this is a landscape where you can get into some of these things a little bit easier and have the potential to grow it into something big. Mm. So they should look at that mm. when they're thinking about investing. Mm -hmm. In addition, there's no glass ceilings here. A lot of times we, in other countries, have limits just because we're black. Certain genres, genres or markets we just can't get into because powers that be. Here, there's none of that. Mm -hmm. You have money and the wherewithal to do something, you can do it. Right. And that's the difference and that's the freedom that we, mm -hmm. we are here to, to experience. Um, I always get, what are you doing in Africa? What do you, and I, I say, I'm here because everyone else is here. Mm. What do you think other black people are missing out from staying away from the Monday night? Um, identity, yeah. freedom. Thought, freely thinking. Yeah. I, I think different when I'm in Africa. Yeah. Mm. When I'm at home, it's such a hustle and bustle. Even now when I go back, like I, I can think clearly. You know, the song, I can think clearly now. That happens mm. because a lot of the things are lifted off of your shoulders you don't even realize that are on your shoulder. Yeah, I, for me, it wasn't until I first came to Ghana that I realized, and went back to the States, that I realized my thought process. Oh, like yeah. the pressure oh, yeah. of the hustle and bustle, the and what you're a black woman, what are these people thinking about me? So it wasn't until I had the experience here for 10 days in 2015, um, and then going back to the states, and I'm like, okay, this is what freedom is. Africa like, can free your mind. This is what <laughs> this is what that feels like, yeah. and that's why I've been on it from 2015 to 2019 on how can I get that feeling back. That's why I've been coming Con back since 2005. What do you think we can do to empower ourselves as Black people, Africans, to really have economic freedom? Educate uh, ourselves on the truth. Mm. Apart from these conversations, as far as like understanding each other, like um, Ivy said earlier, because we are coming from all over the world, right? We have Jamaicans here, we have Trinidadians here, we have Canadians, we have the British, we have Americans. So if we're all coming in, we 
we're all coming in and we're all starting something new. I think, under, again, I'm going to use the pioneer word. We are the pioneers, right, to, to start something when Ghana is only 67. Yeah. Mm. So imagine Ghana in the next 10 years. Even that overbridge that they're building, that was not here just a couple of years ago. So there's growth here and, again, being patient with what is, what is happening here understanding what is happening here mm. right when i migrated out of ghana i was like uh, 13. you know my father you know took me to uh, new york it's so different from when i left so so different yeah yes yeah, so um ghana ghana is just so different that's why i gotta ghana say is before when it's you come, so before when you come back home um around that time when i left i didn't come back for like five years so when I came, I'm, I'm 31 now, so I'm trying to do the math. That's, it's not long ago at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can clearly see someone who lived outside in Ghana. You can see the disparity from skin and all. Now it's so hard to tell where they talk. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you. Like, I can't tell. You just blend it. Before you can just see, like, who's lived outside of Ghana and who's local. But now it's kind of hard unless you go to, like, outside of a crime, people in the market and stuff. Then you can see because it's not now. It's like... It's, mm -hmm. So you see, you see, Ghanaians are living good. Yeah, yeah, Ghanaians are living good. <laughs> Ghanaians are living good. You gonna get a lot of comments. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying all Ghanaians, but there's been improvements. <laughs> and hey, I'm happy for the comments. Yeah. Doesn't hurt. <laughs> if I can get chased by snakes, <laughs> what's your comments gonna do to me? <laughs> um, we are wrapping up the. Uh, we are wrapping up the conversation and. Uh, if you guys do have any final messages to our brothers, uh, family, whatever that may be, mm -hmm. um, please do. We we'll start with Ivy, the Ivy Prosper. You start with me. Yeah. Um, just know that Ghana and Africa it can be your home, mm. and it can be a home for life, or it can be a home that you go back and forth. Because some people will have like a vacation home, a retirement home, whatever it may be. It can be a home that you go back and forth. And know that it is only because of history that we are disconnected. And to take the time to have understanding with each other in order to be able to bridge the gap. Because at the end of the day, we're brothers and sisters who've been displaced. And it's important that we, we recognize and, and honor our differences through culture and through um, where we live through naturalization of wherever you lived before and um, to not be afraid to take a chance because life is about taking chances if you want to have success in certain ways taking a chance is the way to get there so um, i would say to people don't be afraid to come to ghana or to go to any other african country to explore and and see a little bit about who you are as a black person um, because you won't you'll learn on the continent what you don't learn over there. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot that they don't teach you in school, they don't teach you in media, mm -hmm. that you will learn when you're on the ground. So even if it's just one trip, I encourage everyone to save their money and make that one trip. Yeah. Um, I actually wrote a book called Are You Ready for an Adventure, The Exodus? I forgot to talk about my book. <laughs> 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 Me too, I wrote a book. Back, back to you, back to you. <laughs> You can finish it now. Okay. And um, what I realize is that life is an adventure. Whenever you feel stuck, being stuck is not a good thing. Being stuck in a system, being stuck in a routine. Um, living a life worth li living is a life living it on your own terms. And if investing in Africa, even if investing in anywhere in the world allows you to maneuver in the way you need to do that. There's nothing bad with diversifying your portfolio. And I feel like Africa is a great place to do that. And we have a lot of people here who have YouTube channels which you can follow and identify how you can do that. So put your money to work. Don't just go out and spend $500, 200 pounds on a meal. Like put, put it to work. <laughs> Buy some land because in the next 10 to 15 years time, whoop, you gonna wish you did. You gonna wish you did. Yeah. Like how so, people wish they did with East Lagos. Yes. I mean, this has already happened. You can yes, see it happened. It happened, it happened already. Just move yeah. next door. Yes. Yeah. It's not it's too late. Yeah. My book, <laughs> which I forgot to mention earlier. <laughs> Plug. My book is called Your Essential Guide on Moving to Ghana. I wrote the first edition in 2018, 
Um, but then I wrote a second edition in 2019. So the second edition is the one I usually recommend people get because there's more information in that version. It's available on Amazon. You can get the uh, downloadable version or you can get the physical book copy. And I did that book because so many people were asking me questions about moving to Ghana and information. I compiled it all in one place. So you can get that book on Amazon. Awesome. I think it's also on, on Walmart's uh, book page as well. Mm, awesome. Mr. Um, Rush. Looks like I got to write a book now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, um, yeah, I think you already mentioned it. I, you know, try to, try to, try to invest. You know, you don't have to, but um, you're not going to regret it if you put a little bit of money back home. Um, even if it doesn't appreciate in value, you are employing people if you decide to open a business. Um, you know, the unemployment rate is extremely high and you creating one or two businesses, um, you're helping more people than you think. Um, you can stay back there if you don't want to stay in, the, in Africa, it's fine. By just having something working for you, uh, even if you're breaking even, you are literally doing charity work, you are helping people out. So try to put some of the money you're making uh, back here and, uh, you know, reduce the Gucci belts and the Louis Vuitton. <laughs> um, uh, I have a YouTube channel, Roger Sari. I educate people a lot on real estate. Um, you know, I'm into construction and all that stuff. So if you do plan on, you know, buying land and building, look no further for yours truly. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say come with an open mind and an open heart and, again, patience. I also wrote a book. It's on Amazon. It's called Trust the Process. I started writing it back in 2017 before I officially moved to Ghana. Just on the thought process, like what was I going through? What are my thoughts? Can I do this? Basically to help others go through those um, questions as well. And I talk about my experience of relocating and um, starting a business, but Again, trust the process. So you will go through, and life is just part of life. You're gonna go through anything, but being patient and getting through it, like seeing it through fully, I think is a piece of advice. So open mind, open heart, and trust the process. Nice. <laughs> um, managing your expectations and packing your patience are my two pointers um, because expectations are key. Um, and to just know that Africa is for Africans. And if you're black, you got some Africa in you, whether you want to believe it or not. <laughs> um, I wrote a book as well. <laughs> wow. This is my book. It's just a small green book. I call it like a green book. In the States, it was a green book mm -hmm. that people used to guide them through mm -hmm. the South, through Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. um, and it just gave them pointers of where to go, what to do, what to expect. So that's what this is. It's a cultural guide called Passport Through Ghana, a cultural guide for you to return home. And it's specifically for the diaspora community that's never been here, that knows nothing about Ghana, that has no idea where they're coming. So there's 50 different places in here that's related to our story um, that you should see along the way. Of course, you can't do everything in one trip, don't try. Mm -hmm. um, but we feel that you will come back because the feeling that you get when your feet touch the motherland for the first time is almost like a high you continue to, to mm -hmm. try to get again. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's an urgency that um, is fulfilled with a new sense of responsibility, um, but also privilege mm. to be able to say I'm here and there. I, I, I call myself a bicontinental because I'm always American, but I'm also African-American, so I didn't know anything about Africa. I knew all about America, but knew nothing about Africa. So now, I'm truly an African-American, <laughs> period. I like that. This has been a very um, thought-provoking lesson. It's everything. I learned a lot today here. Um, and viewers, please, they are all different types of diaspora. If you fall under their jurisdiction, African American, you know who to contact. A Ghanaian American, you know who to talk to. Um, Canadian American, uh, Canadian, Ghanaian. There's no American citizenship on me. It's Canadian. Canadian. Okay. So Canadian, Ghanaian. Keep calling me American. It's Canadian. Ghanaian, Canadian. Ghanaian, Canadian. Yes. You know who to talk to. But listen. To reach out to <laughs> any of them for an advice, yes. And uh, comment down YouTube below, well. comment down below if you guys want us to continue conversations like this, mm -hmm. and then uh, we'll be very happy to bring it back to you guys. And uh, if you if you want to sponsor the show, please feel free. <laughs> and uh, guys, thank you all for coming and uh, you know, having this great conversation. Thank you, for that. thank you, thank you, yes. Thank you. And uh, this the food is sponsored by.
Deja vu shirt cut. <laughs> yeah, so we have it right there. Yeah. So we will put some well, clips of us eating in there. Go ahead. I was gonna say that um everyone's getting everyone's getting right. Yeah, food, yeah, okay. Good. My food is good. Yeah, that's how I found her. Just a quick thing. Riding down the street, I saw a, an American food truck, and you don't see that here. Right. I was like, ah, oh, that a food truck? I said, where you from? They were like, what's up? We jumped out and been, been sisters ever since. So what year was that? 2021? Like 2020, early 2021. 2021. Yeah. So we, that's what it is. We're here, and we just... Yeah, Ivy was one of the first people that I've met in Ghana. I was I, I look back at that picture all the time. My hair was so fuzzy and crazy. <laughs> I looked so young, but I was just so excited to be here because you don't usually hear that story. Yeah. A lot of times people would say to me like, um, do you have a husband here? Like know, boyfriend? What what are you doing yeah. here? And I'm like, oh yeah, I come to start a food truck business, do Jamaican food, and it's just like. And she was so young, and she was so weird. Was just, like, why would you do that? She's had her challenges. Yeah. Woo! But then strong, you, you yeah. brought that huge platform with that news story on yes. NBC. I did an yeah. NBC nightly news, and then also one of my helped with my uh, my YouTube channel. I was on Denta as well, so. It's been a ride, but it's been a blessing, and that's why I would never regret. So is yeah, everything going old. smoothly, relatively now? Now, I think because I, I've, I've learned a lot, right? I'm not in the New York mindset. So I can understand when a Ghanaian says this, I'm like, okay, maybe an hour later, right? <laughs> when they say it's gonna be done at this time, I gotta leave room for mm -hmm. like five other obstacles before I think it's just gonna go that right. So, she learned to manage her expectations. Yeah. Exactly, I was there to that. Manage your yes. expectations. That's true, yes. I'll change. I'm not, we are done. So I think a lot of people leave because they want things to work the way exactly. they are used to. Yeah. And you just don't get frustrated and pack your bags yeah. and just leave. You have to be it's, it's not going to work like that. You and cannot change okay. the system. You're going to get too frustrated. You can't. It will change over time, but understand where you are and just adjust accordingly for your own mental health. <laughs> <laughs> your own mental, your own mental. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Do Do you think it, we should encourage Dash Prince to involve himself in politics? No. no. Why not? <laughs> well, first of all, you have to know that certain roles in politics, you, you have it. So the diaspora, depending on the diaspora you are. You actually not even depending on the desk, but always mm -hmm. there are certain positions in, in government that you have to be willing to give up your citizenship mm -hmm. in another country to actually be in some of these leadership positions mm -hmm. in yeah. government. And not everybody wants to give up their citizenship. Mm -hmm. As much as people want to get the Ghanaian citizenship, they also want the benefit of two worlds. Absolutely. Because sometimes having the benefit of two worlds actually supports your business ventures. Mm -hmm. It helps you. You may you may need access to something. Somebody may need access to a loan to help them do something here in Ghana. And when you have given up your citizenship, there are some things that you will no longer have access to. Sometimes there's grants, like Canada gives a lot of grants for different things. And you may be giving that up if you decide, I will give up my citizenship and just be solely a Ghanaian. Yes, we people want the Ghanaian citizenship because you want to feel that you have access to certain things here too. Like, Opening up a business is much easier when you have citizenship in Ghana. You know, there's different things. But if you give it up, now you're closing yourself off to some of the things that will help you. And the things that help you with whatever business you're doing also helps Ghanaians. You may be doing a business like he's employing so many people, and you may not be able to do some of that stuff if you don't have access to some of the other things that are outside. Also travel. Travel is easier when you have another passport. It's sad to say, but the passports from different African countries don't give you as much access as having that passport from Systematic. the UK, Europe. Intentional. You know. Yeah, so Systematic. it's like, so sometimes there are things that you have to understand the benefit of both worlds. There's people who pay for citizenship. There's a YouTube creator who paid for a passport from uh, from the Caribbean. I remember, I forget which island it was. He got his name. He's a tool guy, right? Yeah, Tyler. Tyler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he got a he got a yeah. passport yeah. from yeah. a Caribbean country yeah. so that it helps him travel around the world and continue his content creation easier than the Nigerian passport. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be a government official <laughs> and you're willing to give up your citizenship, then you can look at that. I personally don't think that it's something that I would recommend people do. You can voice your opinions about certain things that can be changed. I agree with if you're living somewhere to 
voice your opinions about things that you think can be changed, but you also have to look at the things I'm asking to be changed should be something that's not just to benefit me, but also benefits all Ghanaians. Because we're, at the end of the day, you're integrating into a community and it has to benefit both, not just one group of people. Right. So, um, so no, I don't encourage, I personally don't encourage saying you want to become, you know, become a president or vice president or MP when you're coming here as a diaspora person because you also don't have a full understanding of the political landscape in the country. You understand the political landscape in the country you're coming from and you might be comparing it, but it's like comparing apples to oranges. It's not the same dynamics in politics mm. here as it is where you're coming from. That's my opinion. Interesting. I'm just saying I like that. No. <laughs> By the way, I, I love the presentation yeah, of this. this is so I haven't cute. I haven't opened it yet, but oh my that looks like a passport. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 <laughs> but I know the story of the green, the green yeah, yeah, me in the too. US. Yeah. Because it's like, because a lot of Africans may not know this. I think South Africans are the ones who have the biggest understanding of the whole racism yeah. and yeah. and, and, and sure. segregation yeah. situation that Americans dealt with. I mean, Canadians dealt with it too, but it's not as highly spoken about what happened in Canada, like in the US. The US has bigger media power, so you hear more of the US stories. But this is the reason why I never like to drive. Um, to certain parts of the United States because of the, like you could go somewhere and you could be meeting some racists. We met racists yeah. going to certain places because we did road trips a lot growing mm -hmm. up. We drove across the yeah. eastern US. Yeah. And we would so go to some states we would go to some gas station to one east of Washington. You can see the way everybody just you walk in and you're like, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. what is this black person doing in this yeah. place? And you're just like mm -hmm. um yeah. looking like should I continue to go in or what? Yeah. So yeah, so the Green Book, for those who don't know, I don't know if you went yeah, to detail, no. but it's like, it was a place that gave black people it was a the places where you can yeah. go and feel safe as yeah. a black person. Yeah. Yeah, what the Green Book was all about. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good stuff. No problem. Hey, when you buy, make sure you say what you're sorry. <laughs> okay. I'll get my permission. Well, I'm going to need a page in here. Do you have any copies? I do have some copies for you guys. Okay. Oh, love nice. It, love it, love it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for watching. It's been an amazing, amazing uh, conversation. The uh, information is on the screen and also in the description. And uh, yeah, if you're looking to buy some properties, come through me. I'm also get my commissions. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's see bye bye to the people watching. Yeah. All right. Bye. 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 <laughs>